This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee. Um, if everyone can do the needful to their electronic devices, that would be appreciated. Um, any declarations, financial or otherwise, relevant to any of the business being transacted today, now is the appropriate time just to declare that. All good. Okay. Uh, I have apologies just from Gordon Dunn, and we're joined by Gemma, Doug, Emma, Rachel, Linda, and um, Sinead, I think, will be joining us shortly through the, the Starleaf facility. So you're all welcome to the meeting. And um, if the clerk just wants to indicate Gordon's delegation of vote, now I'll invite her to do so. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote under Standing Order 1156 to the Chairperson Paul Given. Okay, thank you. Um, item two is just the draft minutes then of the meeting that were held on the 18th of February. And if members are content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Members agreed. Um, thank you. Matters arising, um, just a couple of items. Intergovernmental relations and EU exit uh, structures. The Assembly EU Affairs Manager has provided details of the various structures of intergovernmental relations in the European Union extra structures, and it's there for your information, and it's pages 12 to 34 of your meeting pack. Um, uh, another item is the Policing Board response to the Department's draft budget. Um, a copy of the response is uh, in the meeting pack again at pages 35 through to 38. The Department is due to provide additional information on the budget in the near future. Uh, so if members can just note this uh, response from the Policing Board at this stage. Chair, can I come in there on the Yes. I was raising just on the budget issue. The, as you'll all be aware, the Spring Supplement Estimates has been published, and if you open the the yellow big yellow book up at 185, page 185, which is the Department of Justice uh, part, they have actually named, and I don't think I've seen this in our department, but they've actually itemised their uh, proposed changes into Amy and Dell spending, uh, so it means they're doubling up in a lot of their uh, columns, which they don't seem to do in any other uh, department. So that might be just a, a fashion that some of our finance people and justice like the way they the format of it, that, that may be just their way, their practice. But the, the substantive piece for me is that in column A14, which is Legal Services Agency Northern Ireland, they propose changes uh, to a 83 million net provision. They they propose increasing that by a further 40 million. And I just don't know why that is the case. And it's just to try and find out information on that. What why that uplift? Because it's, it's it's quite a steep uplift uh, in change and in, in gross provision. Uh, you know by nearly. 50% of what the standing net provision was. I just wanted to know what that would be. So it's A14, Legal Services Agency Northern Ireland, and it's the R2 changes proposed. Okay, well, if members are content, we'll raise that with the department and seek some more clarity around that issue. Um, the other item is, again, Mr. Fru, you had raised this last week, but we had checked around the pay settlement for police staff and the department has advised that it wrote to the PSNI on the 2nd of February confirming that it had approved the pay award for the 2019-20 year for uh, the police um, non-industrial administrative staff group, uh, staff group and that award then is obviously an operational issue that the PSNI are to take forward so it was just to provide you that update. Uh, item 4 then is the Criminal Justice Inspectorate report on the care and treatment of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system. Um, <clears throat> the committee agreed that an official from Sajini would attend today to outline the key findings and recommendations in its report on the care and treatment of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system. The relevant papers are pages 40 through to 173 of uh, the meeting pack. Um, so members, there obviously is a residual interest here because there was a justice committee inquiry that was carried out on this. I was the chair back then. Um, I don't think any other members actually that are on this committee were involved in that, but uh, there was a, an inquiry and the committee made recommendations, so there is an interest here around how this has been taken forward or not. So um, I will at this stage 
uh, invite the Chief Inspector of Sajini, uh, Jackie Durkin, who's joining us through the Starleaf facility, and she's the lead inspector, um, or she's the, the Chief Inspector for Sajini. So can I welcome um, Jackie to the, to the meeting? The session will be recorded, reported by Hansard and then a transcript published on the web page in due course. So Jackie, if I can hand over to you, um, just to outline some of the key points in relation to your report. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the committee for the invitation to talk about the treatment of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system inspection report published in July last year. My attendance today is especially pertinent given Monday was National Victims of Crime Day. I hope the paper I provided in advance was helpful. The lead inspector, Stevie Wilson, is unable to attend today and sends his apologies. I'm going to talk briefly on what the inspection was about, what we found and what the inspection report recommendations are. This was an inspection on what the criminal justice system does to support victims and witnesses and how well the victim charter and witness charter have been implemented. The inspection focused on the services provided by the PSNI and PPS, including the PPS managed victim and witness care unit. Inspectors also examined services provided by the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, Northern Ireland Prison Service, Probation Board for Northern Ireland and the Youth Justice Agency. Inspectors looked at each stage of a victim's or witness's journey from the time a crime was committed until they no longer wanted support, even if there was no prosecution, court hearing or conviction. The impact of crime was unique for every person. Some victims of very serious crime demonstrated incredible resilience, while others had been left completely devastated by what might be labelled as less serious crimes. Navigating the criminal justice system was complex and confusing for victims and witnesses. They didn't know about the victim charter and witness charter, and some didn't know what help they could get. They were concerned that whoever they spoke to was well informed about the crime, had a professional sense of caring, and were knowledgeable about the help that might be needed. Whole system awareness, ownership and delivery of the charters was needed. The charters are not aspirational goals, they are minimum standards and entitlements. Inspectors found some police officers, prosecutors and victim and witness care unit staff were very effective and took time to provide victims, witnesses and their families with the information, support and care they needed. Some were frustrated that there was too much emphasis on processes and targets like issuing letters on time at the expense of having the time and space to engage with victims and witnesses. The Victim and Witness Care Unit provides a positive base for better service delivery and needs assessment. Good administration and logistics were really important, but staff also required the right skills, training, confidence and time to provide the care aspects, assess needs and support victims and witnesses. The report made four strategic and 12 operational recommendations. All were agreed by the relevant organisation. The strategic recommendations are centred on an effective communication strategy to raise awareness of the victim charter and witness charter and how information, signposting to service and support providers and entitlements to services can easily be accessed by anyone in the community who needs them. A review of vulnerability within the PSNI strategic assessment framework and how risk assessment tools might be used for a wider range of vulnerable victims and witnesses. A review of the victim and witness steering group with senior leaders as consistent members for each organisation who will be their organisation's victims champion and report to the head of their organisation. In short, people who can take decisions and get things done. The PPS and PSNI as partners should establish a victim and witness care unit working group that includes meaningful participation and input from victim support NI to examine a future service model that is focused on better victim and witness care and includes options for human resource structures and models and the development of the victim support Northern Ireland rule to include a needs assessment service as part of and co-located with existing care unit services. Options and recommendations were to be submitted to the Criminal Justice Board within nine months of report publication. The 12 operational recommendations included implementation actions for PSNI, PPS, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, the Probation Board for Northern Ireland and the Prison Service. Several required work in partnership with Victim Support NI and one included the NSPCC. In summary, they included better induction and training for victim and witness care unit staff. The PSNI were to review Victim Support NI input to student officer and district training. Better communication and information provision, risk management and needs assessment. 
a PPS and PSNI review of policy and practice for single point of contact with bereaved victims and family members to ensure best practice and raising awareness and increasing enrolment across victim information schemes. In November 2020, I received a multi-agency action plan in response to all the recommendations and I plan to undertake a follow-up review to assess implementation progress at a later date. If there was ever a drive needed to deliver better victim and witness services and against charter expectations, it's now. If there was ever a time to be ambitious about the victim and witness strategy and a quality service model for victim and witness care for the, the victim and witness care unit, it's now. The ongoing pandemic has created a backlog of additional Crown and Magistrate Court cases that need to be heard and disposed of. That requires all relevant parties to be ready and available to ensure a fair trial in a safe environment. I'm very aware that criminal justice system organisations are experiencing issues with staff availability and working from home arrangements. I'm also acutely aware that the availability and readiness of defence solicitors and counsel are vital to case progression. However, recovery plans to get outstanding caseloads back to where they were lacks ambition, and the lessons learned and benefits gained during the pandemic need to be banked and built on. Vulnerable victims and witnesses will have become more vulnerable and anxious as uncertainty about if and when their need to give their evidence drags on. A clear and adequately resourced roadmap is needed which identifies and prioritises the most vulnerable victims and witnesses and gives them the support and information they need as their case progresses to a conclusion. Case progresses to a conclusion. They include many vulnerable people, including children and young people who are victims and witnesses. They've had the anxiety and stress of disrupted education in the last year, when that's layered on top of the worry of an outstanding trial with an unknown court date, without good support tailored to their own needs, the risk of witness attrition increases. For many, that support will be needed far beyond the courtroom. I hope my briefing points are helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions members may have. Great. Thank you very much, Jackie, for that uh, and for carrying out the inspection um, in the first instance. And It's been very helpful in revealing what I think is a very serious failure on the part of the criminal justice system to take forward what was a committee inquiry with numerous recommendations incorporated then in legislation when we talk about the victim's charter and witness charter, and yet there hasn't been the cultural reform that there should have been in the criminal justice agencies. Uh, and we, as politicians, can take evidence, which we did do, hear from witnesses and victims, come up with strategies, which David Ford, the then minister, did come up with in terms of a victim strategy. But if it's not going to be implemented by people in the organisations that are responsible, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. So I'm deeply disappointed in terms of the outcomes um, facing victims of crime and witnesses in terms of their experiences in the criminal justice system. Uh, and we need to see real, tangible action to put this right. In, in terms of some of the key areas, um, and I know one of them was around the establishment of a victim and witnesses care unit, um, we talked about a one-stop shop type scenario. For, for, from the time you have uh, a criminal action against you and you're a victim, being passed about from the police to the PPS to legal representatives, and, and so it goes on, including then when it comes to uh, custodial sentences, prisoner being released, uh, and sometimes people that have met the, the, the person that was convicted of a crime and they never knew they had actually been released. This was all meant to be addressed through the establishment of these care units. So you know, why, in your view, has the original intention behind that victim and witnesses care unit not materialised? Well, I think there are a few fundamental issues and central to that is about awareness of the victim charter and the witness charter. And I think as we pointed out in the report, um, they're more than pieces of paper that have to be known about, not only by victims and witnesses, but by police officers, prosecutors, courts and tribunal service staff, anyone who is in contact with victims and witnesses. So fundamental to that is, is knowledge about the charters and the entitlement that they bring and how do you translate that into action. Um, so I think that is a piece of work that needs to be done by all of the agencies collectively and as part of the recommendations. But to answer your question directly, I think the problem is that while the logistics, the Victim Witness Care Unit have made a start into providing some of those services, 
but they don't have the capacity and the space and the skills and the consistency of personnel and the structure in their personnel to deliver those aspects that need people with specific skills to talk with empathy and, and to provide that support and to assess needs. And that's why it's really important that this next phase of development in the victim witness and care unit is focused on providing that one-stop shop that was anticipated and focused on listening to victims and what their needs are. And rather than, which is really important, having really good, as I mentioned in my briefing notes, really good administration and making sure people know about where they're expected to be, where they have to give their evidence, making sure that if they are having special measures or support from victim support on the day in the courthouse, that that's available to them. But you also need people in that victim witness care unit who do have the skills and do have the interpersonal and communication ability to deal with people who at times who are anxious and stressed and angry and frustrated about potentially not knowing about something or hearing about it late in the day or being totally dissatisfied maybe if a prosecution isn't going ahead or there's an adjournment in a case. So I think there's a good foundation there and the report says that. But the next phase of this is about making sure that the development of the victim and care unit, victim witness care unit, is ambitious and is bold and takes into account all those voices that we heard and that others in the criminal justice system hear about concerns about how they're treated by the system and that they're treated as individual individuals and that their needs are assessed, that it's not, if you like, a sheep dip approach. And I think that's really important going forward. And in terms of you know, grasping this issue to, to drive it forward, because the report references you know, the legislation from the Charter um, that, that, has, that is in law, you know, provides that very clear vision and it also created expectations and that hasn't yet been met. So how, how, who and how do we make sure this is properly grasped? Is it the Criminal Justice Board? Um, is it designating people within these organisations that can then be held properly accountable because we know that there's a sensitivity within the criminal justice sphere about everybody's independence and I've often said that independence doesn't mean isolationism, um, uh, that, that we, you can respect independence but that doesn't mean you can't cooperate and operate together. So who should be ultimately responsible for grasping this and realising the the ambition that was behind um, the Victims' Charter and the legislation that that actually puts it into statute? Well, I think the whole of the system has to be responsible and accountable for it, but ultimately, as we said in the report, the Victim and Witness Steering Group have a huge role to play in terms of the work that's being done to look at a target operating model and a new um, revised model of provision of service in that victim and witness care unit and to present those options to the Criminal Justice Board, who ultimately uh, are inclusive of the Minister and the Lord Chief Justice and public, Head of Public Prosecution Service and Permanent Secretary. And ultimately, they have a role in making sure that those aspirations and ambitions for what victim and witness looks like in Northern Ireland, how is that translated into action, how is it resourced and um, obviously the Chief Constable has a huge role to play in the Criminal Justice Board as well. So the Victim Witness Care Unit is staffed by Police, Public Prosecution Service and Victim Support Northern Ireland staff. The PPS manage it. The P PPS I know are committed and have already started work and looking at alternative models and, and including Victim Support Northern Ireland in that work. So it's really important that the voice of victims is heard about what their service needs are and how that's translated into action. Because we know there are lots of recommendations from lots of different uh, reviews and reports and the time for recommendation is over and the time for action is now. And as I said, even more so when we look at where we are in terms of backlogs, in terms of vulnerability and anxieties. And you lure the anxiety of the pandemic on top of someone who's already in the criminal justice system, who's expecting the case to be dealt with, and then certainly in the, the short to medium term. They've had a delay over the last year. 
so when are they going to be dealt with? But all the leaders, to specifically answer your question, every leader in the criminal justice system is really vital, really important in making sure that victims' voices and witness voices and good quality service and care for them, that basically life is breathed into that victim charter and witness charter and making sure that people know about it and how do you translate that into really highly effective services and that that happens on the ground, whether that's a police officer, as a first responder, whether it's a prosecutor, whether it's a court clerk or a member of the prison service or our probation board for Northern Ireland. So everybody has to own it to make it work. Uh, but ultimately, the decisions about what that victim witness care unit looks like and how brave senior leaders are prepared to be and what option they go for is down to them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, um, Jackie, with your, your comments around the recommendations and the time for that are, are, are over. It's action that's needed um, because that's what we wanted years ago and the victims uh, and witness charters have been put in place. The five-year strategic plan. We're all meant to achieve. You know what your report even has has said needs to still be achieved, and and that's what concerns me. That these organisations have not put into effect the cultural changes um, that um, should have been put into effect, and that that concerns me because that failure has an impact on those that we're meant to be supporting the most. And I know from experience there are individuals who do get well looked after by you know, in terms of police and PPS. And I've brought victims to the PPS and met with them individually. Um, although the, sis the systemic failures here is what the problem is. We can all point to individuals that can say, my experience after a crime was one that I was well looked after. But there is a systemic failure here in the criminal justice system um, that needs to be addressed, and I hope your report, your re report, leads to that. And and finally, for me, you know, how much confidence do you have that this multi-agency action plan will fully address your report's findings and recommendations within a timely fashion? No. Well, I mean, I have to be hopeful, and I just want to echo what you said there. I think it's really important, and and the report notes it as well. There were some really good examples of really highly effective police officers and prosecutors and, and staff in the Victim Witness Care Unit who were go going above and beyond and had uh, provided that dedicated and professional support to people. And I think it's important not to lose sight of that as well. But you're right, there is um, a sense that this is an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, I'm hopeful that. Once we have an agreed action plan, um, it has all the indications. I have certainly had to date that the things are happening, but we can't have another kind of go at this. This has to be uh, grasped and has to be advanced now. And as I said, I think in terms of what the victim witness care unit, the care bit needs to get the emphasis. Um, there, need, there are people who are very able uh, very highly effective administrators that can issue letters and can you know, make arrangements for things to be in place. But in terms of really listening to the concerns of victims and witnesses when they contact those services and signpost them to other services that will help them with the trauma and the stress that they're experiencing, then I think that needs to happen. Um, I think you, Dame Vera Baird QC has very recently has actually consistently over some time, but very recently has talked about uh, victims and witnesses being treated as bystanders. But victims and witnesses are vital to make sure that there is a fair trial and they have an opportunity to give their evidence. The police put a huge amount of resources into investigating crime. Prosecutors put a huge amount of resource into prosecuting crime. And we have to make sure that victims and witnesses are taken care of so that they can give their best evidence when they need to. Okay, thank you, Jackie. I'll bring other members in at this stage. So if I can bring in Linda Dillon. If you just unmute yourself, Linda, I'm not picking you up at this stage. Try again there. Yes. 
Nope. No, it hasn't came in just yet. Linda, can I... I'm not picking you up, so let me bring in um, Gemma Dolan, and then I'll come back to you, Linda, if you if we can fix that. So, um, Gemma Dolan. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Jackie. Uh, I just have one question. Um, during the inspection, did you find any trends in terms of how the experiences of victims correlated across different types of crime? So, like, how did the experience of victims or witnesses of sexual crime compared to the victims of hate crime? Uh, we didn't look at specific types of crime. We are looking at more in terms of vulnerability across all types of crime. Um, there are other reports and, and recommendations in relation to uh, you know, modern slavery and human trafficking, child sexual exploitation, domestic violence and sexual violence that looked at specific issues for victims of, of those crimes but this inspection was more widespread in fact it was really focused on making sure that rather than looking at if you like specific or specialist services for those types of crime is looking at the experience across the whole of the criminal justice system because what inspectors found was that someone something that might look quite you know to someone that might, might look like a low level um, crime or might something might be dealt in the magistrate's court and you would think oh well you know, yes, it's an awful thing that has happened, but you know, someone should should be able to cope with that. But what the inspectors found was people were completely devastated and felt unsafe in their own homes, um, while other people that had you know, really very serious offences um, appeared to be more resilient. And and that changes throughout the progression of a case. Someone can have different needs at different stages of whether there's a prosecution or not, whether they go to court or not, and um, even after court. So I think this uh, inspection report really highlights that continuum across from, from when a crime happens to someone right through to if they do get a conclusion, if there is a conviction in court. Uh, but so there wasn't any kind of correlation or analysis by crime type, but rather it was more a focused review on the different types of vulnerability and how well all victims and witnesses were supported right through their progression of, of their incident, if it was reported or not, or how it progressed to court, if it progressed to court. Thanks, Jackie. That, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. And Chair, that's my questions. So you can try and get Linda again if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, let's let's try and see if um, we can bring Linda Dillon back into the spotlight, please. Okay, Linda. Sure. Can can you hear me now? Yes, you, you're coming through clearly now. Thank you, Linda. Okay, thank you. Uh, apologies for that. I don't know what happened. I went out and came back in again. So, thank you very much, Jackie, for your for your presentation. And I mean, some of the questions that I have have been answered in, in your responses to the chair. But just a, a, a few wee things. First of all, did you did you pick up any, I suppose, sort of things around where the blame tended to lay, regardless of who was actually to blame? So, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I very often find in dealing with um, my own constituents and with different issues that the blame lays with the PSNA, regardless of where the blockage is. So if it's PPS who decide that there isn't enough evidence to charge or if it's the judge who decides that they're going to bail the person or that they're not going to send them to prison, the, the, the blame always comes back, in my, in my experience, to PSNA. Is that something that you picked up in, in your inspection or, or not? Is that just something that, I mean, that, that I have experienced, but it's not the general experience? No, it wasn't something that was picked up, but was picked up was the absolute confusion about the system and how the system operated and who did what at what stage and you know throwing somebody a leaflet doesn't cut it people aren't ready to absorb some of that information in a leaflet form or written form sometimes they'll want to talk to somebody to talk them through the process sometimes they'll want to ask more questions about their own particular case or the system 
in more general terms about who does what. So you're absolutely right. There is confusion about the okay. role of the police in investigating and the prosecution service in prosecuting and what ha happens at court um, and what the judge is required to do. And, and in terms of listing cases and where responsibility for that lies um, and the role of defence, solicitor and counsel, there's still a lot of work to be done um, to make it clear to people in a way that they find it easier to understand, um, to communicate how the system works and what the victim charter and the witness charter means for them. I think you're right. I mean, that point of contact is, is vital, that assistance with understanding the system, because as I say, that's where I, I very often find, and that has a knock-on impact in terms of confidence in policing. So, I mean, certainly of, of anybody, I think it's to the, the chief constable's um, advantage to certainly, um, you know, fulfil these recommendations because it does have an impact on, on confidence in policing their jobs, absolutely no doubt about that. But all of the other leaders, as you said, have to have to play their part in that. He, he can't do it on his own and, and that organisation can't do it on their own. Just a, a quick thing on the, the victim's charter. Apologies, I've turned off my camera to try and improve the connection, so that's why you can't see me. Um, in terms of the victim's charter and the witness charter, obviously the, the widespread lack of awareness, I mean, as you've outlined, was was shocking and we need to address that. What impact do you foresee that being realised, you know, that, that, that full potential of the victims and witness charters being realised? What impact do you foresee that having on victims in practical terms? And you've kind of given a wee, you've touched on that already, but but I mean, in, in real practical terms, if, if they're aware of it, they understand it, what, what, are, what do you think the, the outworkings that will be? Well, I think the outworkings have to be the victim witness strategy, and that has to be focused on delivery against the victim charter and the witness charter. Mm -hmm. So that's for the victim and witness, you know, steering group to look at the strategy and the current strategy and say, does this deliver against those charters? So it's turning what they have in the strategy into you know what you need to get what you want so uh, you, you know, they need to look at what are the aspirations of fulfilling the, the requirements of these charters that are entitlements do they deliver against access to information access to services you know special measures when they're required assessment of need so that i think has to be the focus and if there was more clarity and visibility of delivery against those charters in the strategy, then that, I think, can only but help filter out to embed in every organisation. You know, this is why we're doing this. We are doing this to support victims and witnesses and to deliver against their entitlements in the charter. Uh, and I think those connections can only but help in terms of embedding awareness. Um, but I think the critical, one of the critical things that we have found is the you know, uh, recommendations from, you know, myself and, and the rest of the inspection team, or whether it's from S Sir John Gillen or from whatever, other, any other reports, but victims and witnesses have been telling us this for years. This is not new. Mm -hmm. You know, people being confused about how the criminal justice system works and what annoys them or who they blame regardless. Um, none of this is new. Victims and witnesses have been telling us this for years. So now is the time, I think, with this action plan to really uh, grip it, to grasp it, and to deliver against it. And, and I think that will be vital in terms of where we need to go, given, as I said earlier, the accumulating backlogs and the chances that some victims and witnesses will be waiting a very long time before their case actually gets to trial. That's brilliant, Jack. Thank you. Appreciate that. Can I ask just two other quick questions? You talked about a follow up review. Am I am I am I right in understanding that a follow up review would be a very narrow piece of work around the recommendations and whether they've been implemented? And when yeah. do you foresee that potentially being? I mean, would that be? Would you be talking about in a couple of years or? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a danger if I use you know, it. Say a date now that is kind of like yeah know, I'm not asking can't. for date because I actually <laughs> fully understand that yeah yeah but, but I suppose just but yes, within two years 
mm -hmm. I would I would plan to do a follow up review. And yes, the follow up review is an assessment of uh, delivery against implementation and the impact of implementing those recommendations. And they would usually be done within two years. So I would be planning to go back and look at these recommendations and the implementation of them, certainly by 22-23, that sort of financial year period. I think that's excellent. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we should be doing more of. And I know even in previous committees and within the policing board, it was one of the things that I kept saying, stop doing reviews, let's look at the recommendations that have previously been, you know, come to us, what has been implemented, what hasn't and why. And I think that that is something that we need to be doing right across our, our committees and our departments. Just a last question, and it's not actually in your report, but I'm asking for a view. Um, I don't know if you're you're familiar with the the Barna House model in relation to um, um child I'm aware, victims. Yeah, I'm aware of, um, of the model and yeah. uh, the content in the Gillen report in relation to Barn House. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not suggesting that will be lifted and implemented here because I I do think that you know something should you know should be specific to here and what suits suits us, but. Do you have any view on whether something like that would be beneficial, you know, in terms of child victims and witnesses and, and trying to make their experience a very different experience? Because obviously child victims and witnesses are a very specific um, group of people and you've outlined that yourself, even in terms of where they're at this particular year around education, around lack of support right across the piece. I mean, young people who would engage with youth services and youth services are still doing a lot of good work. But it's not what it would normally be, you know, in terms of face to face and yeah. and and things like that. So I, I'm just wondering, is there? Would you have a view on that? If yeah, you don't, well, that's fine. I'm not a no. Not well, well, what that. I would say is that I think trauma informed practice is something that is coming more and more to the fore, and I think you know even in terms of victim support, NI training with police and and how that informs service delivery and practice and and why. Um, victims and witnesses might be feeling the way they are, but um, if the Barnhouse model, I know it's being looked at by departmental officials as part of the Gillen review, mm -hmm. but if it, I think it needs to be informed by children and young people and Derek, what and listen to them about what they want and what they need. But I think certainly in terms of piloting it in Northern Ireland and what mm -hmm. it might look like. But it has to always be with the right resources. It can't be a half-hearted attempt. If we're going to do it, then let's do it right to give it every opportunity for success. Mm -hmm. um, these, you know, to, to get a really effective high-quality service model is going to need resources and it's going to need the right people. And we know that. And sometimes what we do is front end a pilot with you know the really early adapters and people that are, are going to make a success of it no matter what but then you say right well that's enough we've piloted that for long enough then how do you translate that into live service so it doesn't become you know if you only live in a certain geographical area of northern ireland you've access to those services um, and actually for children and young people when you take them far away from their usual home environment and community that in itself can cause Trauma. So I think we need to think very carefully about what that might look like. And obviously, officials responsible for doing that sort of modelling and consultation will, will be looking at all those issues. But I do think even among criminal justice system practitioners, trauma-informed practice is something that is coming more and more to the fore. And there's more an awareness of why that drives certain behaviours or emotions in individuals. Jackie, thank you very much, um, Chair. Thank you. I suppose at this point, I just want to raise a, a concern, Chair, and it's probably more for the, the next part. But given um, the points that, that have been made by the, the Criminal Justice Inspector, particularly around that point of contact, and we know the importance of communication between all of the different bodies and victims, and when we seen what was put forward by the probation board in terms of the impact on their services and what they'll be able to do or rather what they won't be able to do in relation to victims because of the budget constraints that we're going to face i mean i have big concerns but that's not a not a question for you to answer i'm just flagging that up for the for the chair for something that we need to be looking at as a, as a committee chair thank you very much okay, okay.
Thank you, Linda. Um, can I bring Emma Rogan in from the audience into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Jackie, um, for your presentation um, this afternoon. I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, Jackie, the strategic recommendation four, it talks about the development of a victim and witness needs assessment service to work alongside the existing victims and witness care unit um, services that are in place. Can you give me some sort of in, more information on what that needs assessment service is and how it will improve the services? Yeah, so at the minute, co-located on site in the victim witness care unit, there's you know one in Derry and one in Belfast, and you have police officers and you have public prosecution service employed staff and victim support Northern Ireland staff. And what the inspectors found was that there needed to be more work done in conjunction with victim support and when an assessment of need was carried out. So at what point? was a needs assessment for what that victim or witness needed in terms of support or signposting the services and at each stage what their requirements were. So as we know, some cases may take some time to move through to prosecution, through to court and then for trial or disposal. So it was making sure that at each point that that was informed by good practice from Victim Support NI who had um, different skills potentially to the police police officers or the PPS staff who are in the victim witness care unit and making sure that the victim voice again was heard and that needs assessment on, on what they needed at a particular point in time, which can change as, as I say, as a case progresses through the system. Okay, um, thanks, Jackie. I have one um, final question just for you. What is, what's your assessment of the current aftercare support for victims of crime? You know, once their case is either um, after it's been to court and it's whatever the outcome may be, or if a case fails um, because of lack of evidence or, or whatever other reason it might be that it, it's deemed that it won't meet the threshold for, um, for, for court. Well, Victim Support and I provide a community service even after a case has been disposed of, but as well as, um, I mean, in terms of, of a, the victim information unit and information that is available um, to victims, whether you know, if that's it. And there's some discussion on, and it's mentioned in the report about whether it's an opt-in or an opt-out model, but it's about making sure that victims have access to information um, at an appropriate point. So I do think there our support services available, the, the effectiveness of signposting at the right time to the right service for them is something that, again, that is mentioned in the report. But I, I think there are services available, but it's again, it's making sure the victims and witnesses can navigate through the system and provided with information and the right signposting to those services when they need them. Um, so I, I think it's there, but again, it's about clarifying and making it very clear what's available and how they access them. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. I have no further questions. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for the presentation, Jackie. I suppose um, I, I'm really concerned about this because you know, the report is thorough um, and it, it really does take into account the spectrum of people um, who may be reluctant uh, partners or stakeholders in the whole justice family. And it could be a world that's unknown to them and a whole world of language that's unknown to them. And I note one of the comments saying about each story, each individual victim or witness may need a very specific and different type of care package surrounding them, uh, given at the outset that they even know that there is such a thing as support available to them. And when I line this up with the other conversations, we're having a committee about budgets and resources. And I know, Jackie, you mentioned that you know capacity is an issue um, for some of these organisations. I, I, I just do wonder where this scope is um, you know, realistically, currently within the organisations. Um, and I accept that some of it is a cultural change. It's not all about finance, you know, that, that there, 
there is that need. But I think for it to have any real effect, that recognising that this is specific to individuals and it is about a person to person. It's not a letter in the post or a leaflet. You know, it's it's that and that that's quite labour intensive um going forward, you know. So I just want to find out if you can see where the scope is in that. And also, Jackie Jewari, I think a lot of this work in the absence of the justice partners maybe getting it right, um, a lot does land on the voluntary sector and um charitable sectors who are probably doing some of the heavy lifting on in this regard without much recognition of it. And I'm really conscious in this new world and new climate that those organisations are probably struggling to make ends meet. And if you anticipate, Jackie, then you know the 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 services that are there and people are trying their very best. If you anticipate that they that even they might be under further threat at the moment, so we could actually end up in a worse position than we were at the time when this report was compiled. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I suppose my brief answer to that would be, well, I don't think we can afford not to do it. Um, I think that it can be very off-putting for victims and witnesses. We know that, you know, that in terms of you know, just over half of crime is reported. So that's an awful lot of crime happening. People aren't coming forward. And if, if a chill factor that, to that is that victims and witnesses don't know or don't feel confident that they're going to be supported um, throughout that journey, uh, which is lengthy. We know it's lengthy. We know it can be complex. We know how they feel about it can change from time to time. So um, I think it's a, a case of we have to, as a system, the criminal justice system has to provide um, quality services for victims and witnesses to feel confident to report crime and to follow that through and give their evidence. Um, to make sure that there's every possibility and every chance of securing a fair um, and robust um, trial and conviction if, if that's required. So I think in terms of the funding piece, I don't think it's all about new money. I think some of it is about thinking about what we've got at the minute and what's in place at the minute and the funding that's available from the department through to likes of Victim Support Northern Ireland and NSPCC and how do you, do you use that? So I don't think it's necessarily a complete injection of new money, but obviously the criminal justice organisations and the department um, will have their own views on that. And a lot of that will depend on the new operating model that um, PPS and PSNI and Victim Support are looking at at the minute. Um, but I don't think we can afford to do this half-heartedly, or I don't think it's you know half measures. I think we've seen over decades uh, recommendations and reviews and reports, and this is an opportunity, as I said, to be grasped to get to let's try and get it right this time, um, because I think it's too important not to. I think sometimes there's a reliance potentially on the. You know, potentially defence solicitors and lawyers maybe knowing that the support isn't as good as it should be or could be. And so then how does that play out in terms of, of um, fairness and injustice being delivered? So um, I suppose, yeah, absolutely. We're all aware that budgets are tight. We know that funding is going to be very difficult. But I think this is an area where there's been underinvestment. I think there are staff that potentially need reskilling, but not every not every member of staff is going to be the right person to be, you know, a listener, an active listener, an empathetic listener, um, and it's maybe not even necessarily the people we have at the minute doing those roles. That new model needs to look at, as we've said in the report, at a new human resources strategy for that victim and witness care unit, and what are the sorts of skills and the sorts of um, communication and interpersonal attributes and the type of people that want to be doing that work because it is very stressful work in itself um, for the staff involved in doing that and the police officers in, in doing that work. So I think it's about looking at what's the preferred option, what's the optimum model, and then for the organisations and the department to see how that can be resourced or where the shortfalls are. But again, as I keep saying, I think this is an opportunity not to be missed. I don't want to be making the same recommendations 
you know, in two, three or four years time in relation to these issues. Thanks, Jackie. And I think that's a really good point you make about the um, and it's a worrying one, you know, that that defense defense lawyers could actually see this as being part, you know, manipulating the, the weakness in the system as being part of their case, you know, and pushing hard against maybe people who don't have support. Um, and and I and I do like the tone. I have to say, you know, it is filled with that um, real realization of the need for empathy. And you're right; not every person is set out. You know, their personal skill sets may uh, lean in a different direction, and that might be what's needed for their job. So it might not just be as simple as adding on to somebody's job description. You know, if they've got the the skills that they do their job well, you, you know, you can't just plug this on to the end of it. That that might not cut it, um, and in very many cases, I wouldn't believe it would. But I still, uh, I'd like to go back to that other part, um, Jackie, because I know we talk about the justice family and the need to get this right, and and rightly the report does focus in on that. Um, but do you feel? I, I personally would have the um, impression that a lot of the voluntary organisations and counselling and all of those, you know, these cases that aren't being dealt with properly. Um, that this report has identified, they're popping up in other places and in other forums. And had you any handle on that, or would you have any concerns that that level of support might not even be there now? Well, it wasn't anything as part of this review. It wasn't to looked at in any great degree. I think this report was more focused on were victims and witnesses clear about where they could get support services if they wanted them, rather than looking at the if there were pressures on any of those other support services yeah. um, and signposted organisations to do that. So, and it's a bit, you know, to be honest, it's a bit. Of, it can be a bit of a. a I'm trying to look for the right word here, but people can choose to go to their own medical practitioners or GPs yeah. and get support through that avenue. So sometimes they're not always looking for that support from the justice system. They have other things going on in their lives and they may be seeking support um, from services through their, their GP practices. But when they come to the criminal justice service and wet system and when they look for that support from the victim and witness per unit, then if that's not available or doesn't satisfy their needs um, and they are particularly vulnerable and they are particularly anxious and stressed, then it's about knowing where they can be referred for that help. But I couldn't say with any any authority about the impact of that on those support services. Okay, thank you, Jackie. It, 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 I appreciate that. And I know it is about, you know, to my mind, if we get that first piece right, that people know about the charters and that they're there and the support. But I am minded that even though we've identified many don't, and that's worrying in itself, um, that's not to say that they're not getting some level of support somewhere else. And I'd just be really conscious that the ball isn't dropped on that um, as a further addition. But I take your point. I think I think the, the report is excellent and the recommendations really go to the heart of the problem. So it's there. It's you know, like Linda said, we don't need to keep doing reviews. It's there. It's committing to it. Thank you, Jackie. That was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. And Rachel Wood. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jackie. Um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been covered, but I appreciate um your answers so far. I suppose you've already touched upon a, a wider piece of work, which I think needs to be done, um, not just for the case of victims and witnesses, but also for all of us in terms of how our criminal justice system works. Um, we certainly don't know about it. I mean, we, it's not part of the curriculum in school. It's not talked about. You know, most of us don't know what goes on within courts or within the police or the PPM until perhaps the unfortunate times that we have to come into contact with them. So I think that's a bit of a feeling on all of our parts, you know, and something certainly I would like to, to explore going forward. But and just to touch upon the charter, and I have to be honest, I hadn't heard of the victims' charter, the witness charter before your report last year. So um, that's maybe a feeling again on my part. But also, if I don't know that you'd said in in your recommendations, your report that the victim charter and the witness charter are not just leaflets or posters or websites. I absolutely appreciate that, but. 
do you see if, could, or do you think that maybe there could be a wider piece of public education on this needed um, and perhaps you know um, putting information out into our communities about you know this it does, does exist and, and you, you can access this information and do you think that could help in any way absolutely i think it's really important that community awareness and, and again the points this as well is that first initial when a crime happens and I think what you're talking about is just general even if you're not a victim of crime or witness to a crime it's about awareness that the victim charter and the witness charter exists um, and there's some of it I know is covered in some schools it depends on, on um, what they decide to include in the curriculum in terms of, of what's taught um, to pupils about how the criminal justice system is structured and works but i do think there is a lot to be done in terms of awareness about the rules and the different roles of um, investigators and places investigators and the prosecutors as prosecution what the role of the judges and defense and everything there's so many so many parts um that come together uh, whether it's prosecution or defence and the judicial aspect to that. Um, it's not simple, but we have to find a way to make it more simple for people to understand, particularly those who are victims and witnesses to crime and those who are vulnerable or who may have language or may have learning difficulties or may have capacity issues in terms of them being able to understand how they fit into that system and the importance of them being supported and feeling confident to give their evidence to help secure a conviction and progress a case when it's needed. Um, and obviously the right to a fair trial and making sure that that happens and that there are robust convictions is absolutely vital. But I do think there is a piece around communications uh, champion that we've talked about about again in the report I mean, making sure somebody at a senior level is part of that victim witness steering group to bring together those strands of communication across the whole system so you don't have one organization one week going out to say well this is what we do as part of the system and then the next you know week or month you have somebody else concentrating on something else to make sure that there's that collective ownership and delivery of the charters and that there's that cohesion across the criminal justice organizations and agencies about what the messaging is. And I think if we had more connect connectivity and joined upness in that approach, it should certainly help not only to, to bring the criminal justice organizations in closer together and how they work, but about making sure that there, if there are synergies and efficiencies to be had, then they're capitalised on, and that communications champion role within the victim and witness um, steering group, um, strategy group, will be key to that. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that answer. Um, in terms, I just wanted to pick up on one of the parts of your report, and it said about the frustration on meeting targets, and I know it was touched upon earlier on um, by the chair, but also in page six, too much focus on statistics and sensitivity about independence. Could you elaborate a wee bit of what that means, if you can? Yes. Yeah. So what the inspectors found in the victim witness care unit that um, the staff there felt there was a lot of pressure about making sure that letters were issued on time and that they met targets for administrative processes. And then they also were the people who were answering the phones to people well, who could be angry or distressed or anxious or stressed about something that was um, coming up, uh, whether it was their own particular case or court date or whatever. So that's bit about the, the administrative targets and that was um, certainly sources sourced from a number of, of pieces of evidence from staff who were involved in that and um, police officers and victim witness care unit staff who really felt they didn't have the time to actively listen be victims and witnesses because they knew there was a stack of work. The case officers in the victim witness care unit are administrative officers, so they have a lot of administrative functions to do. And again, as I said earlier, in terms of the skill and the capacity and the, you know, the the difficult conversations that they have to listen to and they have to respond to, whether that somebody is somebody is in a high emotional state or is confused or whatever that happens to be, people need time and space to be able to respond professionally to that. And it's a big ask. And we need to make sure people are confident when they do that. 
So the piece, um, the second part of your question, Rachel, was about the independence piece. And yes, there is this sense that the prosecution is taken on behalf of the public or on behalf of the state, and that there's some, um, you know, there's some sense that the victim is not a participant. They're, the victim witness is a bystander. They're not necessarily a key participant when it is vital that they are kept on board, no matter how long that journey takes. If there's a prosecution and their evidence is vital to secure a conviction, that they stay with that process and they're kept informed and they're, if they need special measures to make them be able to give their best evidence, that that's in place. If they need information about how the case is progressing, then that's available to them to make sure that if they need to turn up in a courtroom to give their evidence or to give their evidence by video link, that they stay with that case to, to give it. Because otherwise, that investment from the police in investigating that crime or the prosecutors and prosecuting it, if that prosecution is dependent on victim and witnesses' evidence and they aren't supported and they don't want to give their evidence because they're frightened or they've just decided, I can't do this anymore, that there's, they can stay with it to the end until it's needed. And if they need support beyond that court hearing, then that's provided to them. So that comment was really about making sure that good witness care doesn't compromise the objectivity or the impartiality of a prosecutorial decision or investigation. This criminal justice system should be capable of taking good care of victims and witnesses and keeping them on board because they are a vital part of a prosecution. Yeah. And I think that's where that's where that was coming from, that, that preciousness about independence. If if we can coalesce on anything, it should be around taking care of those most vulnerable in the criminal justice system that we rely on to come forward with confidence and give their evidence um, and feel confident about giving their evidence when they need to. Thank you, Jackie. I couldn't agree more. Um, absolutely. I mean, I, I haven't been in a courtroom myself or asked to give evidence in court, but it's an, you know, the, even the idea of it could be very intimidating for somebody, especially if they've been a victim or a witness, you know, um, so the more that we can do to support them. Final question, Chair, and it's just to clarify, Jackie, you'd said about um, the in the care units in Derry and Belfast that um, PSNI, PPS and victim support are there. Um, are there, are there, there in both positions? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. No problem at all. Thank you. That was just to clarify. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. I think that concludes everyone that wanted to ask questions, Jackie, from you, and I know the next session here is to go into the Criminal Justice Agency, so can I thank you on behalf of the committee for uh, both the report and making yourself available today. I know that this committee is under significant pressure to deal with legislation, um, and I, w I would like us to be able to do more in terms of some of Sir Jenny's reports in other areas, um, but th th this is one area that the committee was keen in particular to to look into it, so I do appreciate you taking the time today to, to brief the committee on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Okay, members, um, well, that neatly takes us into then, obviously, the, the next item on the agenda, which is um, different criminal justice organisations. So we have officials from the department, the police, the PPS, um, and victim support um, as well. Um, that are attending then the meeting via the Starleaf facility, and uh, that's to outline how um, the findings and recommendations of the report uh, are going to be addressed. So the relevant papers, members, are pages 175 to 281 of your meeting pack, and that includes the multi-agency action plan to address the report's findings, the uh, 2013 victim and witness five-year strategy and key findings and recommendations then of the previous Justice Committee, which was back in 2012, and that was the inquiry into the criminal justice services available to victims and witnesses of crime. So members, we have quite a number of witnesses, so um, obviously just in managing time and so on, um, we will need to, to, to provide uh, brief questions um, and then um, succinct answers to that. 
um, from the, the different witnesses that are with us. So let me formally just welcome um, Assistant Chief Constable Mark McEwen, uh, Community Safety Department from the Police Service, Ms Marianne O'Kane, Senior Assistant Director of the Public Prosecution Service, Geraldine Hanna, Chief Executive of Victim Support NI, Julie Wilson, Head of uh, the Gillen Implementation Policy and Legislation Team and Victims and Witnesses Branch within the Department of Justice, and Liz Semple, Policy Officer for the Victims and Witnesses Branch in the Department of Justice to the meeting. You're all very welcome. Um, it will be reported again by Hansard and a transcript will then be published in due course. So um, I think I'm going to be inviting at this stage uh, Julie Wilson, who's going to uh, provide an outline of the key points in respect of the response to the findings, uh, and that will be on behalf of everybody. Uh, and then we will move into questions. So, um, Julie, I'll hand over to you at this stage. You're very welcome. Is it all being done via the, the castle? <coughs> second. I don't see anybody else. Christine, on the audience list here on the computer. They all dropped out. The only one I have is Geraldine. <laughs> Please don't ask me. <laughs> No, well, you, you're here from the victim's perspective, Geraldine, so I appreciate that. Okay, so I can only see the public prosecution service at this stage. Okay, members, while, with our faith. while we get the technology of this sorted out, um, Geraldine, you'll just have to patiently wait um, and, 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 and the PPS. That's fine, sir. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next items of the agenda. I'll come back to this once we have the Department of Justice um, back in, because uh, at this stage I only have uh, the PPS and the police, from what I can see, and Geraldine, and we don't have Julie. So... Um, if we can just move on, members, to the next item then, it's the protection from the stalking bill with further information from the department um, and then a provisional committee timetable and the motion to then extend the committee stage. So pages 283 to 291, the department has provided additional information that was requested during the oral evidence session on the principles of the protection from stalking bill at the meeting on the 21st of January. So that's there for noting. It will be added to the electronic bill folder and the bill web pages um, for members' benefit. The committee stage uh, of the protection from stalking bill commenced on the 29th, or sorry, commenced on the 9th of February, and the 30 working day period provided under the standing orders for completion is due to finish on the 23rd of March. Standing orders provides that before the conclusion of the 30 working days, a motion may be made in the Assembly by myself as Chairman of the Committee or the Deputy uh, Chairperson of the, uh, on, your, on my behalf to extend the period of the Committee stage. The motion must specify a date to which the Committee stage will be extended. Um, a provisional timetable for the Committee stage has been prepared and that members as pages 286 and 287 of the meeting folder. Uh, the timetable um, is based on an extension that would take us until the 10th of December. Um, while the intention of course members will be to complete the committee stage of the bill earlier, um, if that is possible, the extension does provide the flexibility to manage the very heavy legislative programme um, that the committee has, uh, including this bill, the committal reform bill, the expected justice miscellaneous provisions bill, and the damages uh, return on investment bill, assuming that it comes to the committee and other committee work priorities and issues that uh, we know can arise unexpectedly. And of course, uh, taking into account the uh, different recesses that take place during uh, this time period. 
Uh, given the limited time until the end of the mandate, it will not be possible to undertake work on each bill sequentially, and therefore maximum flexibility is required to enable the committee to prioritise its work on a particular bill at certain times when necessary. So, members, if you are content in terms of the proposed timetable for the committee stage of the stocking bill and uh, the extension that will be um, put forward by way of a motion uh, for the uh, 10th of December, then the wording of that motion uh, that I need members just to agree to that I can then sign off on is that in accordance with Standing Order 33-4, the period referred to in Standing Order 33-2 be extended to the 10th of December 2021 in relation to the committee stage of the protection from stalking bill. Members content? Content? Okay, agreed. Um, so, members, it, it is scheduled. I see it's on the um, order paper. I think for the eighth of March, uh, in terms of the debate that will be on that motion. Obviously, it'll be more of a, a technical um, debate in that respect, in, in terms of the procedures that are being followed. But that'll be on either the eighth of March um, or the fifteenth. But I think it'll be the eighth of March. Okay, so. Um, if I can just uh, take us back then to the previous item, um, if I think we can go to Julie at this stage. So can I just check, Julie, that you're able to, to hear us okay? Uh, yes, Chair. Apologies, we had difficulties logging on. So, um, but yeah, we can hear you now. Yep, no, no problem. That's, it's, it's the age that we're living in at the moment, so uh, I understand that these things happen. Um, so that's not a problem. So if you're if you're ready, just to give your initial um, brief to the the committee, then we can pick it up from there, Julie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we're grateful for this opportunity to to update you on our response to Sujeni's report on the care and treatment of victims and witnesses in the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. Um, we provided the committee with a copy of our action plan in November. Um, Sujini has highlighted system-wide issues that need a, a collaborative multi-agency and a system-wide response. And so I'm, I'm very glad that Liz and I are joined this afternoon by other members of the Victim and Witness Steering Group, um, ACC Mark McEwen, Senior Assistant, uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, Marianne O'Kane and Geraldine Hanna, Chief Executive of Victim Support, Northern Ireland, um, who together are all leading work to implement elements of our action plan. Um, if it's helpful, I'll take a few minutes to set out the approach that we've taken, some of the progress that we've made so far, um, as well as some of the current priority work that has been initiated by the steering group. Um, the inspection found that whilst there had been some improvements, more work is needed and in particular it highlighted specific issues around the challenges for victims and witnesses in navigating a complex criminal justice system, the need for consistent, accurate and timely provision of information to victims and witnesses and the need to improve both public and organisational awareness of the victim and witness charters and the obligations and entitlements that these represent. So clearly there are links between each of these issues. Um, I would also add that um, everything that we do across the whole criminal justice system has the potential to impact on victims and witnesses and can make their experience of the justice process better or worse. And so we recognise the need to embed an improved awareness of victims and witnesses of their needs and rights under the charters into our planning our policies, our processes, and crucially, our organisational cultures. As Jenny noted, um, the criminal justice system is complex and it cuts across the roles and responsibilities and the operational priorities of, of multiple departments, agencies and services. And that's why we're responding by putting in place both strategic and operational partnerships to address the issues that Jenny has highlighted. So turning to the action plan itself, um, you're aware that uh, Sujini made four strategic recommendations and 12 operational ones. Where it's been appropriate and it has made sense to do so, we have incorporated um, related recommendations under the same work streams. Others are more standalone in nature and need to be taken forward by the, the lead organisation. Um, however, oversight of the, the progress against each of the recommendations sits with the Victim and Witness Steering Group. Um, if it's okay with you, Chair, I'll focus on the strategic recommendations. 
Um, the recommendation one uh, called for DOJ to implement a strategic comms solution within one year of publication of the report to raise awareness of the profile of the victim and witness charters and to promote ease of access within communities. Um, we're in the process of establishing a thematic communication subgroup to lead on the development of this co communication strategy. We recognise that this issue, though, requires more than just a simple communication solution. It also needs to be balanced with steps to embed the significance of the charters across organisational cultures. And so we'll be also tasking the group to consider how, to, how best to do this. Um, we aim to have that strategy in place by July in line with the Sujini recommendation. And Chair, I would draw the committee's attention to um, the fact that in our published action plan, we had mistakenly sign signaled a deadline of January for this work, but it's actually July. Um, however, in the meantime, we are proactively looking for opportunities uh, uh, to, to raise awareness of the charters and uh, to promote them, as well as other victims and witness issues, and we'll continue to do that with our partners. Recommendation two was for PSNI to review how its current strategic prioritization of vulnerability aligns with delivery of outcomes impacting on all victims. I'm going to defer to ACC McEwen to provide a detailed update on the focus and progress of this review, but I wanted to highlight the significance of this work to other recommendations and ongoing related work to develop a process for continuous needs assessment, as well as the review of the service model for the victim and witness care unit. Recommendation three was about the role of the victim and witness steering group itself. Uh, since the report was published, we have recalibrated that group to include senior leadership from across agencies. We've revised its terms of reference to focus on providing strategic direction to deliver improved outcomes for victims and witnesses. Um, it's responsible for agreeing strategic priorities and objectives in relation to the care and treatment of victims and witnesses, and it will oversee both um, delivery of both this action plan and of a new victim and witness strategy for Northern Ireland. The steering group will report to the Criminal Justice Board twice a year on progress and on relevant emerging issues, and members of the steering group will also act as champions within their own organisations. The steering group has, has met, um, the re reconstituted steering group has met and has identified four immediate priorities that it's focusing on, and these include implementation of the action plan, uh, work to ensure that victim and witnesses, witness interests are met as we work to recover the justice system, uh, work to improve victim access to information that's relevant to their case, and the development of a new victim and witness strategy. Finally, strategic recommendation four relates to the review of the victim and witness care unit and the development of a new service model for that unit. That working group has been established involving PSNI, PPS and Victim Support Northern Ireland. Um, work is well underway with a view to putting an options paper uh, for the future service model to the Criminal Justice Board. Again, operational colleagues will be happy to answer questions on this. Chair, I hope this has provided uh, the committee with an overview not only of uh, the action plan and the work we're doing against this, but how this work is also helping to inform our overall strategic response to victim and witness needs and interests more widely. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, just to, to pick up on that issue around the Victims Witness Steering Group, if you can just confirm with me who, who are the members of that group? How's that been constituted? Um, so the Victim Witness Steering Group had previously existed in, uh, with representatives from across criminal justice uh, organisations and also uh, victim support and NSPCC Young Witness Service have been represented on that. Um, what we've done is in line with the, the Sujini action plan, we've, uh, we've, we've gone back to organisations to ask for senior leadership to be represented. So, um, so obviously we have um, members of that group here today. There's also uh, the Chief Executive of the Court Service, Progression Board is also uh, a member of it. We've recently uh, written to um, the Law Society um, as well, and uh, to, to invite them um, to, to join as members of the group as well. And uh, I think as, as our work progresses, uh, we'll also want to be reaching out to the health department. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, we'll maybe follow up just as a committee, because it would be helpful to, to have 
the kind of breakdown of who those individuals are in terms of their organisations um, for that. Um, one, one of the areas that you, you mentioned there was the um, the VCU, the Victims Witness, uh, the, the care unit aspect of it. And I know back in, back in uh, 2012 when we looked at this issue, um, it was one of the areas highlighted about making sure that all of the different organisations stepped up um, to provide funding for that. Um, and at times that seems to be a vulnerability that you have different parts of the criminal justice system will put in resource, but not everybody does. How, how are you ensuring, or how is the Department of Justice ensuring that when the, the business case and the model is developed, that it will actually have the kind of um, resources, both financial and personnel, from across the Criminal Justice Agency to, to make sure it actually works this time? Uh, Chair, that work is ongoing and the development of that business case will identify uh, resource implications um, across it. Um, I think what, what's being developed at the minute is an options paper for Criminal Justice Board, which would then be supported by a business case identifying resource implications. Um, if I probably um, would defer to, um, to, to Jerry and Marianne, actually, who have been uh, driving forward a lot of that work, and they can maybe talk you through a bit more of the detail. Okay, thank you. Do, do you want me to go or Marianne? Marianne, do you want to pick um, up on that from the PPS? Uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, there's absolutely no question that adequate resourcing will have to be deployed um, if any remodelling of the unit is to be successful and, and establish the, or sorry, achieve the ambitious aims that are being set for it. The current arrangements for funding of the unit are that we have 28 PPS staff and 14 staff from PSNI with victim support, and those staff are actually funded independently at present. But the um, the working group is looking at ambitious plans to expand the services to um, victims and witnesses around the needs assessment service, and there's no question that significant additional resourcing will be required. If we actually proceed down the, the um, line that we're looking at at the moment, which is actually a more ambitious plan than even the Chief Inspector um, set out in her report, and our projections are that if we do deliver an end-to-end -end service as we would aspire to, but that is probably going to increase um, the numbers of victims and witnesses who will be brought into the system from around 20,000 at present to potentially in excess of 80,000, depending on the, the model that we might um, co-design and depending obviously on the point at which the needs assessment and activities are actually triggered. So we are still looking at um, a variety of options which are to be presented to the board. Um, but inevitably there is a resource impact and potentially a very significant one. And if, if it's helpful, Chair, I can give you a bit more detail as to what that ambitious um, option looks like. If you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. So what we're proposing as a preferred model would see an expansion of the needs assessment that's currently undertaken in the unit. So the PPS staff who currently undertake the needs assessment, if that happens at decision to prosecute when someone's come into court and very much focuses on the needs around enabling that individual to come to court, what we're proposing is expanding that so that needs assessment is conducted from the point of the report of crime. So following the police um, attendance or report over the phone, the needs assessment um, team within the unit, which will be comprised of victim support staff, will um, conduct and make contact with those individuals. Now, not everyone, given the numbers Marianne's just quoted, will get phone calls as such, so there will be a triage model. But what that needs assessment will focus on is the immediate needs of those victims and witnesses, bearing in mind that not all of those cases are going to get to court. So that hopefully will ident help identify vulnerabilities and enable those needs assessment um, workers to refer on to other agencies such as Victim Supports Community Service, other counselling support agencies at that early stage. Needs assessment, we're talking about developing what I, I keep term a needs assessment passport. 
that will journey with the victim through the um, criminal justice process and after court. That will be updated at key stages, will be shared um, between the three agencies involved to ensure that victims are not having to repeat um, needs that have already been um, assessed and also that, that that's a continuous assessment because as um, Jackie outlined earlier, needs can change as people progress through the system and unfortunately the length of time it takes for some of our cases to get through the system. You know, children will have aged, there'll be several birthdays, so needs will change. So it's really important that we have that continuous individual um, needs assessment piece. It's not going to be a panacea for all. Uh, obviously, the numbers we're talking about will not mean that everyone will have a dedicated call. Um, some people will be asked to do that via um, email or letter. And obviously, some victims will not want to engage any further at that point and will be um, content to wait. But what we're hoping is that this individual risk and needs assessment process will be a key component in ensuring that the system is better able to respond to the individual journey and support needs of victims, which Jackie highlighted earlier and is throughout the report. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Um, uh, Julie, you, you mentioned the new victim strategy that is going to be developed. Um, and I suppose what I'm trying to find out here is in terms of members having confidence that this time it will be taken forward with the kind of step change and the cultural impact that it'll have in the organisations, um, given the previous five years strategic plan that was meant to achieve uh, all of the outcomes that this report have highlighted, highlighted that hasn't been achieved, and of course the, the Committee for Justice report back in 2012. So if we're, we're going to get a new strategy, how confident are we that this time um, we will actually see the kind of transformation that needs to happen within the organisations and I would be keen to hear from the, the PPS and the police service in terms of what they're doing within their organisations to address that cultural change that's required. Um, thanks Chair. Um, we, uh, we've met as a steering group to, um, to begin to look at the, the strategic framework um, which which we'll be presenting to um, the Criminal Justice Board next month. But the, the steering group has, has agreed a number of strategic priorities. Um, uh, and, and the first of these is around gaining a better understanding of the, the experiences and needs and interests of, of victims and witnesses. Uh, but our next strategic priority is actually focused on, on that organisational um, culture change and focus that you've just described. So it's about embedding an improved focus on victims and witnesses across the criminal justice system. And that includes, um, I think that, that, that does rely on things like the strategic leadership that the steering group will, pro uh, will provide, um, the leadership at an organisational level that will come through members of, of the group, uh, the steering group acting as, as champions. Uh, it's also, I think, about um, proactively building in steps into um, our policy development, our strategic development, our operational um, practices, so that we are consciously um, considering um, the needs of, of victims as we are going through those processes of developing policies and practices. Um, it's also, I think, about listening to um, uh, to, to victims and, and, and engaging with uh, victim representatives and that's why I think it's really important that the, the uh, that victim support and young witness service are, are part of the steering group. Um, the other um, the other element um, I think which will make a difference chair is um, obviously uh, the minister has made announcements around uh, uh, developing her thinking on establishing a victim of a victims of crime commissioner and has asked us to take forward uh, that piece of work with a view to uh, a commissioner designate uh, being in place by the end of this mandate. We are working on proposals that we would want to bring to the committee in, uh, in, in the next month or two really and, and then go to uh, public consultation on that. Uh, the minister had established a, a reference group to help inform her thinking uh, on this, but but would see a commissioner as as having a role in um, in 
looking at the effectiveness of the, the victim witness charters, but also the effectiveness of our delivery across the system of, of those charters and the entitlements under them. Okay, thank you. And if I can bring in the police and the PPS then to give a response to that question too. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and I, I think if I may just, uh, if you indulge me for a moment in talking around some of the journey we have been on. So um, whilst uh, understandably there's some frustration um, around the, the time lapse from the, the, the first um, action plan that you, you discuss, I think it, it, these things don't, don't stand still. Um, overall, um, the, the policing service have been on a journey for around 10 years uh, around looking at um, early intervention and crime prevention and identifying vulnerability with partners. Um, and a lot of that work has been operationalized for the last six or seven years. My own department, the Community Safety Department, which has been created over the last year, um, we have moved public protection branch uh, to sit within the Community Safety Department. And a lot of the, the really good practice is really well embedded across partners um, around high harm protocols and, and um, intervention and prevention around that, and then how to manage people through the criminal justice system. Um, that good practice is then being uh, taken from, from that work and disseminated across the organisation. Um, I think it, it is welcome and we all understand the shift that's required and that falling out of the inspection that talks about the need to move from the transactional um, to to being more empathetic, to identifying vulnerability. We all have a very clear understanding of the increase in complexity of the cases that we face and, and the majority of, of incidents and contacts that the police service has at the front end um, very often have complex needs attached to them. And that in itself um, poses real challenges for us in terms of finding the appropriate um, means to, to, to deal with incidents and, and to um, uh, provide the right response for individuals and that can be from uh, very early intervention trying to get people out of a, a pathway of chaotic lifestyles um, and manipulation because of their vulnerabilities right through to, to, to trying to seek justice uh, which is obviously what we're focused on today. So um, I, I say all that not uh, basically put some context around this for the last two years and we have been introducing trauma-informed training for all our student officers. Um, and indeed, our full cycle of district training has now involved or included trauma-informed training, again, to try and help officers at the front end understand um, the, the adverse childhood experiences and the, the vulnerabilities that people are facing and to, to respond appropriately. Um, and I suppose I, I mentioned that as one of the tangible cultural shifts that we are, we are undertaking to enable officers and, and staff to, to deal with what, what, what we're facing um, and to, to provide an appropriate response. Uh, in terms of uh, looking towards, um, it was mentioned earlier on, strategic recommendation two, and our, where vulnerability and the, the, the desire to provide the appropriate response to victims and witnesses and indeed offenders, because very often, uh, victims and offenders, particularly repeat victims and offenders, are, are one and the same. Um, so uh, particularly for, for those who are, have dependency issues or perhaps just mental health, we see um, a, a real overlap with that and it's trying to find the, the appropriate way to deal with that. So that's very much at the forefront as we develop our strategic assessment. Um, a number of our policing plan strategic objectives look at repeat victims, repeat offenders, particularly in the high harm, abuse sort of categories. And indeed, victim satisfaction is a separate um, uh, issue for us as well uh, in terms of a strategic objective. So they all form a strategic assessment we have. We then look at how we provide tangible uh, support to our people, uh, such as at the trauma reform training just outlined. And indeed, there is then the ritualization of through um, what we look at through our daily management meetings, what we prioritise, we look at uh, those vulnerable uh, people, uh, vul uh, incidents involving people with vulnerabilities, missing persons, things of that nature. 
Um, so I'm confident that the police service is very much embracing this. We're moving towards this. I mean, it's, it's a huge area of demand for the police, apart from anything else. Um, we're working closely with partners through the Community Safety Board um, that uh, sits within the department uh, and, and through uh, the support hub steering group that we have with uh, uh, other, other partners such as Health and Social Care, Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland, Housing Executive and others, um, and how we address these issues. So uh, I think there are very tangible uh, things we can point to within policing to say that our culture is shifting. We recognise the needs um, that, that those who require a policing response have and to try and get better outcomes for them. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Marianne. <laughs> Yes, Jim, you ask how we go about changing the culture, and I suppose I'd like to reflect on that from firstly an operational and then a more strategic um, perspective. Uh, the Chief Inspector spoke in her presentation about um, victims need to have knowledge of their entitlements as they undergo the criminal justice process, and we must, as leaders, bring those uh, charters to action. Um, it was noted that the original intention of the care unit hadn't materialised, and you as chair had sought an assurance that it will actually work out um, this time in terms of delivering empathy and, and support. So uh, if I may, I'd just like to respectfully note for the record by way of counterbalance that the Chief Inspector did also record some very positive findings um, in her report, talking about evidence of dedicated individuals who provide great support to victims and witnesses and evidence of a strong management structure with um, good governance. So she wasn't saying that the services do need a complete overhaul. I'd also reflect on the high levels of satisfaction that victims and witnesses are reporting around the service that they receive from PPS in the Nibos survey, in which the um, 1920 survey recorded 85% satisfaction levels about our service. And I don't say that in any way to be defensive, and we unequivocally accept the recommendations of the Chief Inspector's report, and we unequivocally accept that we can enhance our services. On the second challenge around sharing knowledge with victims and witnesses of their entitlements, we do inform um, individuals, we inform victims of their entitlements in an introductory letter, and throughout our communications with witnesses, we make sure that they're aware of the charter entitlements. They're published on our website, we train prosecutors, and we measure quantitative compliance um, by the staff in the care unit. Um, but I totally accept that simply posting information and posting it out um, by letter, putting it on websites, is not enough to bring the charters to life, which leads me to the question of, well, what can we do to actually change uh, the culture in PPS? Um, the Chief Inspector spoke in her report about the need for chief code an ethos of authentic care, and while we do sometimes fall short, that is ultimately our aim, to achieve a cultural shift from a system to a criminal justice service that treats victims and witnesses as being of central importance. She called on senior leaders to pay better attention to the needs of victims and witnesses, and in support of that, when I was appointed victim champion in January 2019, uh, before the publication of the inspection report, I was reflecting on how I could bring my uh, responsibilities in that role to life. And so I established um, a stakeholder forum to um, engage with um, stakeholders and take their views on um, best practice in our service delivery and policy development to through them understand victims' needs and gather real insights that would inform our work and hear the direct voice of victims through their representative groups. And I'm really pleased that the membership is broad and that senior leaders from many organisations have joined us because it's been a critical way in starting to shift the culture within our organisation. And it's already delivering very direct benefits to victims and witnesses for example, our last meeting earlier this month, uh, was focusing on communications with victims and witnesses during the pandemic. How do we inform them? How do we maintain confidence in us as PPS and in the wider criminal justice system? And how do we avoid attrition during the pandemic period and beyond? So how can we make sure 
but they stick with us until the conclusion of the case. At a strategic level, um, I and other leaders across the criminal justice system met on Tuesday of this week to co-draft the new victim and witness strategy. And there was evidence of real commitment amongst that group and a really active and engaged discussion about what is our mission and what is our aim, not just to meet the charter obligations, but much more widely. And I have to say that there was evidence that was very refreshing just to see the level of enthusiasm and engagement amongst that group and our aspiration that we would go well beyond um, these sort of current um, commitments that we've made. I think it's also a demonstration of the um, changing culture that um, Ms. Hannah, who she doesn't feel on the no confidence, said during that meeting that when she was speaking to PPS and police about a redesign of the care unit, that she felt an equal partner in those discussions. And you might say, well, why wasn't that always the experience? But it's very heartening that that's what she was able um, to reflect on. And I was interested just also in conclusion in the comments that Ms. Ms. Woods made about how our criminal justice system works and the need for um, education. And I think there is a real opportunity to raise awareness um, of what the criminal justice system does and what the um, duties upon us in terms of victims and witnesses are, both through school education programs and uh, directed towards adults. I mean, I've always been a strong advocate about the importance of education as a preventative and deterrent um, measure uh, to avoid individuals offending in the first instance and to know and to inform individual citizens what their obligations are when confronted with being a victim of crime or a witness of crime. Um, an example of being around sexual offending, I've long felt that education around the issue of consent is actually critically important. So in terms of changing culture, yes, we have work to do within our organizations and across organizations and much more in the public domain as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for that. Uh, let me bring in other members just at this stage. So let me go to Linda Dillon um, to see if we can bring her into the spotlight, please. Chair, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I have my camera turned off because it, it keeps glitching and it, it, it can be a wee bit off button. Um, thank you, first of all, to all of you for, for your presentation and to, to be fair, a number of the questions that I had um, have been answered and in, in, in what you've already said. So thank you. It, it's, it's been very fulsome. A, a few wee things. The first thing I'm going to raise is actually something, and it's not to to prioritise one set of victims over another, but it is just to highlight that there is there are different issues with a particular set of victims and, and it's because of of my awareness around the issue, because of my, my spokesperson's role. But in relation to, to victims of historical abuse, I think that there needs to be a, a piece of work done, you know, particularly maybe with the, the commissioner in relation to historical institution abuse, because th there's very particular language in relation to working with that particular set of victims and there's trauma informed which i think is absolutely vital and um jackie the, the inspector actually highlighted that the need for trauma informed training and people who are trauma informed to deal with victims and i think that's absolutely vital and really important but for particular types of victims and I'm only highlighting this this particular sector but there are others who are, who are similar I think that there needs to be very particular type of um, trauma-informed training given to those who are dealing with them and as I say a first step could be to meet with the commissioner have a conversation she also obviously has a background in terms of um, violent sexual and domestic abuse against um, individuals so she has quite a wealth of experience but in relation specifically to, to those historical those victims of historical abuse there 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 are serious issues about the language that is used when dealing with them and, and that's just the language that's not even then how the the contact and the communications are are carried out that i'm really flagging that up i'm not asking for an, an answer in relation to that to be fair to, to all of you because it's not directly related However, um, and, and you've already really, um, 
responded, I suppose, or already given, um, as I said, answered some of the questions around the victims commissioner. So I'm, I'm content that you've, you've covered that. But just in relation to recommendation, the under operational recommendation three, um, around the initial review of victim support involvement in PSNA training and that the areas of improvement have been identified. I'm just wondering, and I suppose Jerry, this would be for yourself, for yourself and Mark, can can you give me a wee bit more detail around what those improvements involve and has any been has any work been done to, to address that? Mark, are you content if I talk through? Yeah. Okay. So what we've done so far, Linda, is um, we've had several meetings with the um, police and college in particular, um, focusing initially on the student officer training, and then we're looking at district. Um, we have identified several places in the student officer training where victim support can be play um, a more informed role um, and engage their our challenge. Um, you'll you'll be stuck here all the time. It's always resources. So we're exploring opportunities to nearly develop like a train the trainer type model. So we, we have nearly victim support champions in the college who aren't necessarily victim support people. Um, but it means that it, uh, because of the frequency of the student officer training, it, it takes some of the pressure off ourselves as a voluntary organization trying to deliver that. Um, with um, district officer training, we're also looking at what um, how, how best to engage with them. COVID has hampered us a bit in terms of what we would have done in the past um, more on an ad hoc basis would have been going into like their 15 minute briefings in the morning and doing a little bit um, but COVID has delayed us in terms of significant work in, in that regard. What I will say across both student and district, and Mark, you may want to add something, but the key thing from our perspective is our input into that training isn't about solely talking about this is what victim support is and this is what mm -hmm. we do. It's around embed in victim care. Now, I, I'm not for any um, moment saying that police officers don't already consider this, but one of the um, pieces that has been really helpful in terms of this engagement is um, what we've been going through with the trainers in the in Garneville is looking at the whole actual package of um, training that's delivered to officers and seeing how victim care and also the victim charter can be embedded throughout so that it's not just oh, we only think about victim support whenever that wee woman comes in on um, the third Tuesday of the course. Um, it's actually throughout and I, one of the other benefits as well is having what I would call the champions, maybe not the role, the name because it. Uh, can be confused with our other victim champions, but nearly part of our extended victim support family who understand the whole victim care piece, the victim charter piece, and also what victim support do, having them embedded in the police college means that it's officers hearing from fellow officers how important this is, what the charter obligations are. So it's not, um, I think sometimes it's better to hear from people who understand your role and the challenges you face in your role, um, as opposed to maybe Jerry from Victim Support coming in and saying the ideal, because my ideal as to what I would love them all to be doing, there'll never be capacity for officers to do with the best will in the world. So it's, it's trying to be ambitious but realistic about what we can achieve and I think that that review it's it's work in progress um it's it's by no means finished okay thank you Jerry does does Mark want to come in on that uh, I think Jerry has summed it up pretty okay. well Chair. Um, but I think it is just that um, we're, we're starting with with that training getting it rolled out across districts um uh, afterwards will be another challenge, but Jerry, I think, has outlined that. We're, we're up for that. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you, Jerry, for that. And I'm actually really glad to hear that it's not just about one specific piece of training and that's it's embedded in, in every level because it is vital. Um, and I did highlight earlier, Mark, when I was speaking to the, the criminal justice inspector, that very often, regardless of who's to blame, the blame lands at the door of, of PSNA. So th there is a, a real piece of work to be done there in terms of, I believe that this, you know, this this very important piece of work around engaging with victims and support for victims 
could make a real difference in, in confidence and placing in general. So that there's, there's a big piece of work to be done, but everybody has to play their part because PSNA does get the blame whenever the judiciary doesn't do what victims wanted to do or the PPS don't do what victims wanted to do. So I think that that, that piece around victims understanding um, the process and at what point, you know, who is responsible for what and that it's not a case of that the police are responsible for gathering the evidence, making the charge, ensuring that it, it gets to court. Obviously, there's a part to play around evidence, but um, it is then for the PPS to look, has it met the evidential threshold? And it is the judge who decides whether they get bail, regardless of whether the police um, object to bail, the judge has the final say. And all of those all of those elements are really important for the, for the victim and, and their, their family and other people in the wider public to understand. Um, so it, it, is, it is vital to get that, that information out. The operational recommendation seven then the PPS and PSNA also committed to reviewing the current practice for provision of information in cases involving bereavements and agreed a protocol for managing engagement moving forward by the end of December 2020. I'm just wondering has that been done and the protocols around will the protocols around implements single point of contact arrangements as recommended. I probably think it needs to be wider than just where there are bereavements, but obviously where there is a bereavement, that's a very specific issue. Um, yes, Pam confirmed that the protocol has been signed um, by both organisations and has been in place from January 2021. And what that has okay. agreed is that, that as a default position, it will be the police family liaison officer who will be the mm -hmm. single point of contact unless the bereaved family indicate to the contrary and ask for some alternative arrangement. So what it means is that communications that the care unit would otherwise be issuing will now be transmitted to the bereaved family through the family liaison officer. And the rationale is simply that that relationship will have been established um, very shortly after the, the, the point of the, um, the death. Um, and we don't want to be constantly asking for repeat information or having family who are ready to be traumatised having to engage in cases at different points. Okay, I appreciate that, Marianne. Again, I mean, I think that that is vital. And I've, again, I've seen cases where there has been that point of contact with a family liaison officer and it's worked really well and had a positive impact for for both for both the family and, and for the confidence in, in how the police are handling it. When it comes to the point where, where that is handed over to the PPS, is it still then the family liaison officer? Because again, that that creates that idea or notion that the police have still have the responsibility and therefore if PPS look at it and say, look, we can't, this hasn't met the threshold, and it's the family liaison officer come back to deliver that information that will the blame will be levelled at the PSNA? Yes, as I said before, all of the communications that the care unit would ordinarily issue will now be conveyed to the bereaved family through the, the hands of the family liaison officer. Now, in our communications, um, when we're informing um, victims and witnesses about the decisions taken, there will be points of contact in that letter, so they are free to um, contact PPS directly or via their case in the care unit. So it's not that we are stepping back by any stretch from engagement with these victims. In all circumstances, the assistant director responsibility for the um, business area will actually write a letter to the family within 10 days of the final receipt within um, PPS. And, and that uh, engagement will continue where we need to be speaking to families about matters specifically to the prosecution decisions that we are taking rather than the types of information that the unit is updating. Um, so, for example, today, this morning, um, I was engaging in a case of traffic fatality, and I was asking that the assistant director and the senior prosecutor engage directly with the family to convey certain information about decisions we are proposing to take. So we don't divest our responsibility um, either to care unit staff or indeed to police uh, liaison officers at that point. And I think certainly my experience of working with um, liaison officers is that it's a very collaborative relationship. Um, and if they feel 
that there's a necessity for a prosecutor to engage, then we are entirely happy to, to do so. I mean, Mr. McEwen can comment further if he wishes on that. Yeah, no, 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 thank you. I appreciate the members' concerns, but I think in, in these cases, because of the really exceptionally difficult circumstances, because of the training and professionalism of all of our family liaison officers, I think it is the right thing that they are that conduit for information with the family, um, in the interests of the family. Um, as Marianne has said, there is no um, divesting of responsibility from um, from the PPS, and, and, and I think we, we accept that and recognise that. Um, it, it's actually in those broader, potentially not quite at that level of, of severity or seriousness. It's, it's the cases um, at, at a lower level where I think perhaps information gets confused about um, who's making decisions where and, and whether or not that, that blame or responsibility lies with, with various agencies. So I appreciate the members' concerns, but I think in this case, we're content that, that, that this is the right way forward. I'm, I'm glad to hear that and appreciate that, Mark. And thank you, Marianne, to, to yourself as well. I, th I think it does go back to that piece around people understanding the processes, you know, and, and that's fair enough. And even even the public understanding the processes. I'm going to ask one last question, Chair, if you'll give me a, a wee bit of leeway. It's I, I mentioned this to, to Jackie also around the, the Barnhouse model. Is Are there any um, notions, this is probably more for the department, to be honest, that we would look at something, not necessarily the Barnhouse model, but something similar in relation to child victims and witnesses? Um, if, if I can answer you on that, um, I think there are a number of different work streams that are that are currently going ahead under under the Gillen uh, programme that that all feed into that uh, that Barnahus model. And at the minute, we're looking at the, the kind of procedural bits. So um, so within PSNI, for example, there's a review of ABA. Um, the department has been taking forward a programme to develop remote evidence centres. Um, you'll be aware as well that of the, the, the judge-led protocol to expedite um, uh, cases involving children. And the minister has uh, fairly recently agreed to, to bring that um uh, to, to bring that protocol under the remit of of the gillen uh program as well so there are all of these um different elements that are progressing um the idea is that they do ultimately merge together under a, a, a kind of barnahus one house model um we haven't got to that stage yet but we're beginning to look at at, at what that might uh what that might look like but at the minute we We've been progressing those justice elements um, with various um, leads. The work that we're going to be doing around the protocol is is going to, in the first instance, uh, focus on uh, ensuring that 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 protocol can be extended beyond. I mean, currently it, it applies to Belfast, so it's about looking at extending it uh, time-wise. Uh, so it's been extended until September, but it's 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 looking at making sure that the resources are in place to extend that beyond the, the point of September, but also beyond Belfast. So so our first priority really is going to be looking at that, those kind of resource implications, looking at the impact of, of that uh, and any of the policy implications around that, and then developing the business case to support ongoing uh, extension. Um, but the idea is that, that all of those different uh, Work streams will come together at, at, at some point to under uh, a kind of one house model. Obviously, um, Barnahus is not just the justice elements, there, there are also therapeutic and health uh, uh, elements to that. And uh, I, and that's something that we, we will be uh, picking up again with the health department. The minister has written to the health minister and, and is going to um, be, be meeting with him and wants to discuss around health involvement in this model um, up until this point that they they haven't been in a position to uh, to, to fully engage simply because of, of all of the other pressures and priorities that they're, they're dealing with at this stage. Okay. Okay, Linda. Linda's dropped out. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Doug Beattie?
Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, uh, team, for your presentation, and answering questions. It's been really, really useful. Uh, and thank you. And a lot of the questions have been answered by by Julie, Geraldine, and and, uh, uh, and Marianne. Um, if I could just start by saying, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely, and, and you'll know this, very supportive of Victims of Crime Commissioner. Uh, I think being able to, to bring everything together in a single set of eyes looking at something is is really, uh, really, really important. But could I maybe just drop down a little bit to try and understand something? And I think I've only really got two questions here. Uh, and the first question is dropping it down into the operational um, level. Uh, how do we fill the gap it going forward, uh, and I'm talking about witnesses here, not necessarily victims, and we all know that witnesses, having witnessed a crime, especially a serious crime, um, could be very anxious about the fact that in the future and well into the future, they may have to give uh, evidence and, and, and they bec can become very vulnerable indeed. So how do we fill that gap um, when a witness has been identified to the stage where they're going to be told that they are going to be required to give evidence. Because I'm looking at the PSNI um, uh, Victims of Witnesses Care Unit piece online here, and it says that that, that if you're a witness, uh, we will tell you will, if you will be required to give evidence. But how do we fill that gap between the crime and being told you're going to give evidence, which could be a year or maybe longer? Anyone? I'm happy to say. <laughs> I'm happy to say how I think we should be filling it. No, well, um, Doug. If I can, if I, I can, if I can just ask, if Julie, because if the department, because I appreciate with five witnesses here, and it's very difficult to assign particular questions. So if Julie can be the main point, um, and then if there's other people that Julie needs to decide to reference in. If we can do it that way, otherwise it's going to be difficult to manage this in a structured fashion, but it is for the department to take the lead in this in the first instance. So, Julie, if you can pick up on that, and if you need to, to defer it to others, I'll let you do that. Okay, uh, thanks. Well, I was actually going to um, uh, uh, suggest that, that, that Jerry could maybe say something about the witness uh, support services that victim support provide, and then also about, um, obviously, Jerry, you were about to... Um, to, to, to comment on filling that gap as well. So I was going to defer to you in any case. Great. Um, I think it's a wonderful question, Doug. Um, there is a gap there. Um, now, obviously, ourselves in um, Witness Service provide support to adult witnesses. NSPCC provides support to young witness service. But that only kicks in whenever there's been that identification that you're going to be a witness. So we're, we're taking victims out of it. There is a piece for us, and I think it's something that um, we need to look at as part of that victim and witness care unit development. Capacity continues to be an issue, but I think there's something that could be given um, by police um, or tra communicated to witnesses by police around managing that expectation that this case may not ever get to court, or it may, and it will be some time, if you are concerned, these are support services that are available to you. Um, if you're not, we will hear about you uh, or you will be contacted at a relevant point. And if at any point you want to find out progress, this is that you, you could be directed to the care unit. I think that's the way we do it. And I think we need to um, build it into our development of that new victim and witness care unit model. Um, I'm hoping that that sounds OK to the others, but that's how I would be suggesting how we would look at it. Yes, I, I mean, I'm happy with that, Geraldine. I don't know if anybody else wants to, 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 to add to that, but it, it, is a, it is a genuine problem, and that's why I raised it. And I'll give you an example of why it's a, a, a genuine problem, just to, to try and hone it down. So I know somebody um, uh, who witnessed the kidnapping, witnessed the kidnapping, um, went to the police station, gave their um, statement, uh, had a needs assessment, uh, and they've heard nothing since. Uh, the kidnapping happened very close to her home. Uh, the person was known to her, but has had nothing uh, as a follow-up to that whatsoever. And that's over a year ago. So you can see the gap that I'm talking about. Now that witness is very anxious and has been anxious, and there's not a great signpost. There's nothing proactively signposting them out. So I, I guess it is, a, it is a gap. I think Geraldine's right that she's identified it as a gap, but it certainly needs to be something uh, that's put in there. But can I add, because I don't want to take up too much time, because, I, I mean, that's a fair answer from Geraldine. 
But, but we, and I can't remember who said this, by the way, but somebody says that we're talking about going from a workload of about something like 20,000 witnesses and victims to about 80,000 victims and, and witnesses. Um, and I'm concerned about the resource bill for that. I'm not saying there shouldn't be uh, you know, more resource for that, but with the police um, having a cut and, and, and you know, in desperate times and losing officers at this moment in time, have we thought about what that resource is going to look like? How many people will be dedicated to the victims and witness uh, care unit from both the PPS uh, and from the PSNI and, and other agencies? I mean, I, again, I think I'm going to defer to Geraldine, but that the, the piece of work to look at what those what the options for the model are that's ongoing at the minute, and and that options appraisal will will drill down into the resource implications. Um, uh, so. Uh, so I haven't, had, I haven't had sight of what those resource implications uh, are yet. I'm, I'm not sure that they've fully been worked out, but Geraldine, you would be a bit more over the detail than me if you want to come in. Yeah, the numbers are quite scary, Doug, um, particularly whenever the recommendation talks about victim support doing the needs assessment piece. So I start to get a little bit nervous at this point. Um, what is clear though, and, and this is, it goes back to probably what Jackie said, you know, at the outset of all of this around an ambitious plan and now is the time to do it and we need to find the money, you know, we, we can't really wait any longer. What we're talking about here is that 80,000 is the reported crime levels. So at the moment, victim support deal with from, well, from April to January of this, April last year to January of this year, we had 38,000 referrals to victim support. Now, similar ideas kind of reads across into what this needs assessment service would be within the care unit. Of, say if it was this 80,000, not all of those would get a phone call. Some of them would get an email um, or a letter, which would give them certain information and ask them to come back with a more detailed needs assessment. What we need to start to break down is how, not every person is going to come back and say they want it. Also, even before that, not every one of those 80,000 will say they, wa they want to be contacted for a needs assessment. So we will triage that 80,000 or whatever the, the number is into phone calls versus letter versus email. As the person trans or moves through the system, you're going to get less and less people coming. Um, so you know, obviously not every case, like 30% aren't, there isn't a decision to prosecute. So those those sort of cases, well, those numbers will dwindle as they go through, but none of that takes away from the fact is there will be a significant resources. It's more likely to be on the victim support needs assessment side piece, but there will be a read across in terms of how the management of that team works, how the management of the unit works. Um, but we are hoping that in the probably in the next two months, we should have a clearer def or, um, determination as to what those numbers um, are looking like. And that will be the preferred option in the options paper that's to go to the criminal justice board. But resourcing, you know, I, I, I'm pleased the chair picked it up as his first question to, to Jackie. It is an issue um, and it's something that we need to c consider, not just, I suppose, within departments and justice committee, but government as a whole. There's only a certain amount of money and where are we prioritising it? Charlie, thank you. Marianne and, and, and Mark, I mean, have you modelled what that will have at an operational level for yourselves for, for to provide staff, just staff for that, for that model? Um, I think, Mr. Bailey, I'll, I'll just sort of give you a holding response. The, the work is very much active at the minute, and it's at a very early stage. So what, what we're talking about today is just very much, I suppose, a high point, an end, a full end-to-end -end option. And there are a lot of questions below that. So we have to ask, well, what is the point of need? And is it at the point of report to police for every victim? What's the actual level of need once they make that report? Um, what is the um, scale of the service that we actually want to deliver? And then looking at the consequential results. So what's the percentage onward referral to victim supporting the other agencies for more intensive sort of emotional type support is actually required. So we are at a very, very early stage. And I, I just gave that indication as the high watermark of what the resource impact might be in seeking to deliver the very high quality of service potentially. And um, if I may go back to your preceding question then just very briefly, um, and you were asking about the gap around services to witnesses in um, particular. And that was actually the very subject of the stakeholder engagement forum that I hosted um, earlier in the month. So 
what I was wanting to discuss with the principal stakeholders was, well, what do witnesses and victims want to know if we want to maintain their confidence and keep them with the case in circumstances where we actually cannot definitively say when their case will actually be listed? So we had some really uh, rich discussion around very practical measures that we can put in place to better inform victims and indeed witnesses. So things like the website is obviously an ideal resource. We're looking at new text in our standard correspondence just to try to say that we do understand the anxiety and perhaps stress that this is causing you and your perhaps your family circle. So to try to reach out in a meaningful way to say, actually, we do understand um, and please be patient with us. Now, thankfully, we haven't seen attrition rates in Northern Ireland similar to those actually being reported in England and Wales. But I don't want to be complacent, and I think we have to keep on top of it. Um, I did a, a little bit of a sort of a, a dip sample of cases where attrition rates are traditionally high around um, sex offending, domestic violence, hate crime, and we are seeing um, prosecution rates and conviction rates holding steady. So we're not seeing any red flags that cases are actually, um, we're losing cases essentially, or we're not being able to proceed as we would have wished because victims or witnesses are dropping out. Um, but I am concerned that we're reaching a critical point and sooner or later, that reality is going to hit us. Um, the other challenge, I suppose, is actually to measure and monitor how and when is that happening. And we've had meetings internally about how do we actually get ahead of that and predict um, when, it, when a victim or witness might actually just become so distressed and fed up with delay that they simply can't tolerate it any longer. And it's actually really, really hard to measure. And um, so what we will be putting in place are arrangements whereby you know, case officers in the care unit, decision makers amongst our prosecutor cadre, our counsel at court, they give us early warning where they think a witness or victim is, is concerned and may, may withdraw so that we can actually intervene and try to engage with them directly. Because bluntly, there's no point in counting the attrition rate after it's actually happened. So hopefully that reassures the committee that we are actively uh, working on it and trying to actually um, maintain the confidence of, of witnesses who you've asked about specifically. Um, Maria, thank, thank you very much. And, and Jarlene, thank you very much. I mean, the, the, you know, they're really good answers and it does put my mind at rest that you are, you are looking at these things and I fully get that we may be at a stage where we're still wave topping and we haven't got down into the in, into the into dealing with some of the detail yet because um, I have to say it is it is an ambitious um, program it's good to be ambitious uh, I, but I would hate that ambition to fall down just due to process and resource um, but listen a really good presentation and, and good for answering the questions thank you all very much thank you chair okay. thank you Doug and then I'm going to bring in Sinead Bradley, followed by Rachel Wood. So Sinead Bradley in the first instance. Thank you, Chair. And I'll, I'll be as brief as I can because um, I want to thank you all for the presentation. It really has been helpful and, and I appreciate it as a uh, work in progress. Um, but the updates so far are reassuring. Um, I, I suppose, um, and a lot has been answered because, you know, your um, feed-in has been very thorough to committee, but I, I am minded what, at the outset when I hear, um, you know, talk about centralised services such as, you know, the, the care centres in Derry and Belfast and and understandably so that is the case um, that there will be a centre point in a lot of instances. But I do then find myself as a, as a representative from a predominantly rural constituency such as South Down and I think of people in Kilkeel and people you know in, in rural areas walking through this system and um, I just would like to know you know all of the actions that are pitted against different stakeholders throughout this process is there a constant effort and review to say how can we assure that these services will be delivered consistent, consistently across all um, all areas of Northern Ireland just as a first point please chair um, if I can begin, uh, certainly from a strategic point of view, um, we will uh, we will want to be looking at that as we are as we're developing the strategy. We'll want to be looking at it from a rural grouping um, perspective, and, and, and we're required to, to do that. Um, I don't know whether Jerry, um, whether you are 
would like to say anything about just the kind of the 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 volunteer network that you have and the kind of supports that you can provide across uh, Northern Ireland, if that would be helpful as well. Yeah, I suppose in terms of the um, victim and witness care unit piece, that strategic um, recommendation for, to be honest with you, Sinead, it wouldn't really doesn't matter the location of those places because they're not seeing people face to face. So every victim of crime and witness of crime, regardless of where the crime is reported, should go through the same process where the level of support and, it, and depth of support may um, differ is dependent on need and also that triage model that I talked about because not everyone will get a call but that won't be determined by postcode that will be determined by kind of a range of factors crime type what initial vulnerabilities has been identified by the officer on the scene etc so what will then happen is with that needs assessment piece at that initial stage there will be identification of need for kind of immediate support which isn't really necessarily to do with the criminal justice system more to do with the impact of the crime so what we would call the recovery journey more for victims and that's where there would be a referral to the likes of victim support services, which would operate throughout Northern Ireland and have outreach centres across Northern Ireland. So you will, we will cover that local piece um, in, in that regard and also other support services that, again, will um, just depend on some of them are regional, some of them are more local. But that's one of the um, things that we need to keep on top of in terms of what's available in each area. So I, I don't know if that, that helps reassure you a bit, certainly in terms of recommendation for in the, the carrying a piece and the additional support needs. Um, I don't know, Mark, as obviously police are, are all over um, and news will be feeding in the, the data to the care unit. Yeah, and, and, and again, Jerry, I think you've, you, you've really covered it. it. It does. So the initial approach has to be consistent. It doesn't really matter where the, the actual unit is located. It is about the intervention and the support. It has to be more individually tailored and that can be provided locally regardless of where the actual unit is. So I, I think that, that's been very well articulated. Thank you. And, and I do accept that, but um, I just I just know that um, regarding services in rural areas, very often, you know, the, one of the challenges is the geography and it's having people um, moving from one place to another, you know, and the level of resource it takes to cover a geographical wider spread area can be challenging. And I'm particularly mindful of, um, you know, there's talk about keeping communication channels open and engagement and engagement with a uh, victim or a witness it may be inappropriate in some instances and i'm sure there will be red flags throughout the system you say on no circumstances should that message be communicated via a letter that does warrant um a personable one-to-one -one, um level of communication and i'm just conscious in rural areas that 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 can be challenging and um, I would just be, I suppose I would just like to inject at this point that that level of awareness or thinking is considered through the options and through any thread of thought um, that might form the final piece. Because I, I too often say that um, it's when it, it reaches rollout that you find that the, the rural element hasn't been fully understood um, and the challenges that come with that. Um, but on just one other um, point then, it was, um, I noticed that the, along with yourself um, there, Jerry, there was also the, the bringing in of the um, northern, or the, sorry, the, the prevention piece for, for children. And I know that you said that they did sit in, is that right? I'm trying to find what number, what it was the um, protection of children. Have they sat in at the committee so far? Or have they been part of? Part of uh, the um, are you talking about the the steering group, the victim and witness yes. steering group? Yeah. Um, at this at this stage, um, the steering group is uh, is is just really justice uh, criminal justice organisations. Um, we have um, at departmental level, we've been um, engaging with the mental health champion, and we'll want to continue doing that. Um, um, and I think as as we get further into our work program, we we'll want to look at what other um, partners from other uh, departments and agencies, um, it would help to either uh, be permanent, you know, standing members of, of the steering group or 
attend on an ad hoc basis, but certainly we're alive to those connections across the health pace. Um, we, we will want to engage further on it. Okay, because I, I thought that was a very good piece, but I also did wonder, um, and certainly some of the experience I've had of people coming through a constituency level, some um, of those vulnerabilities can include um, the language barrier that exists, you know, um, from growing populations, our diverse population, you know, so we often think of disability quickly and, and the likes of NSPCC, who, who was struggling to find that, because I, I did say it was September, I think was the the ambition for that, but in terms of then language and all those other barriers to potential justice um, or support, uh, just to get an assurance that they're all being widely considered. Um, just, just to clarify, um, uh, NSPCC, Young Witness Service, is part of the steering group, just to, to make that clear. On the uh, the other kind of um, communication difficulties that you've, you've mentioned, um, uh, we, we have in place a registered intermediary scheme, um, which is managed through the department, but um, uh, uh, PSNI, PPS uh, can, uh, can approach us to uh, engage a registered intermediary who will, uh, who can attend uh, police interviews or, um, or court with, um, with people with, with communication difficulties of, of whatever age and of a, a, a range of different uh, communication difficulties. And there will be people with, with a range of specialisms to accompany them. So, so that provision is in place um, and, and is very actively used within the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, yeah, because I think um, hopefully technology will be part of the solution, but built into that, just the awareness of, you know, people with maybe visual impairments or hearing difficulties, um, that the, the model is built around supporting that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay. I think, Chair, if I can maybe just come in there to say, uh, I think what the member was alluding to as well was in terms of minority communities and interpreter services. It's just to say that that is obviously already um, available to us, and we do utilise that significantly. And I think, again, um, the members mentioned the use of technology. That's obviously coming to the fore more and more um, in the way we're doing business today. But to go back to the point around rural communities and the, the need to communicate in the most appropriate way, particularly when it's at a very sensitive stage, I think that has come out. Um, by uh, our discussions earlier on around the use of uh, family liaison officers um, and, and as we move down in, in terms of seriousness at, at certain parts within the case journey, um, we will take those decisions. We as an organisation have um, taken a step to protect our neighbourhood police officers and again that's something that's available to us as a collective in terms of criminal justice agency. Um, should, that, should that be a necessary or, or appropriate means or indeed that we just go out. Um, so whilst we talk about rural communities and, and the difficulties um, of, of, of reaching out to people there, it's actually not that difficult to, to move as, as a collective for us to go and visit someone in, in the member's constituency. So I hope that gives some reassurance. And if I may, Chair, briefly add a few lines of addendum from PBS. I mean, the fact that somebody's resident in a rural community doesn't mean that they're remote from us by any stretch. And I personally, you know, driven all around the country when I was dealing with cases personally, but where there is a sensitive or difficult decision to communicate to a victim or a family, then the prosecutor will go in person. And even throughout the pandemic, that is still happening. Um, we do it remote where that's the, the, an acceptable way to communicate, but we will still meet in person where the sensitivity of the matter requires that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Rachel Wood. Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you, everybody. Most, as you can imagine, most of my questions have already been answered. So, um, and I just, I was just sort of wanting to pick up on a few just details. Um, in terms of the budget, I appreciate the outline business case will go with the options papers, but is there um, consideration being given about having this, you know, whatever is decided on and the budget attached to be ring fenced? Um, and obviously we were talking earlier on, it was mentioned of 80,000, not obviously not every victim or witness of crime will support um, um, or require it, um, but it was certainly um, 
happy to see um, a variety of options there and um, would hopefully it would be the most ambitious, but uh, the most ambitious may be the most costly. Um, but I certainly would like to know if there was any consideration of ring fence in that budget, just to make sure those services continue. Um, again, I'm going to uh, defer to, to, to Jerry again on the detail, but my, my sense is that we're not at that stage yet where, where we can, where, um, because the full resource implications haven't been identified, then the model hasn't been identified, and that's something that we would come to in the round and look at. Jerry, do you want to add anything? No, I suppose we, we haven't defined what the actual specifics are in terms of numbers and f whatever option the proposal or whichever option the Criminal Justice Board with, will go with, there will obviously be a business case. I suppose I, I would just be keen to ensure that where possible we are starting to think about the monies early and I, I certainly would support any idea of ring fence and monies um, to make sure that um, the relevant um, resources are available to deliver. On this, I suppose one of the things that I am really conscious of and really quickly is just the, the victim and witness carrying a piece in our enhanced role here has a reputational issue, potential risk for victim support. So it's essential that we get this right. We don't want to be going into a process which where we end up being lumped in alongside all the rest of the failings. So um, it's key for us. Um, and that's why an ensure, ensuring that appropriate resources go with it will be tantamount to ensuring that we can be properly involved. So the resource piece is, is one that, um, you know, um, members probably won't be surprised that I'm concerned about and obviously that the agencies will, will need to ensure that um, the relevant um, resources are there in order to have the capacity we need. Definitely, Jerry. thank you um, for that. Um, I suppose just um, looking at the action plan and going forward, and then obviously you've got need, you know, we're going for a specific model. I mean, it's certainly heartening to see the collaborative approach, you know, across the agencies and everybody getting on board and also being ambitious, as everybody has said. So, I suppose um, maybe I'll maybe answer my own question in terms of budget and resourcing, but um, is that the biggest challenge then going forward, do you see? I suppose that may be true for Jerry again. Um, yeah, th that's the biggest challenge for me because if it doesn't um, appear, we'll not make any progress in, in that regard. Um, obviously, we need to be realistic about what, what we can achieve within the monies as well. Um, the other challenge for me goes back to that culture piece um, that Jackie highlighted at the beginning and um, Marianne has talked a little bit about. And while there has been strides um, to improve, I think there is more work done needed, as um, Marianne said, both within organisations and across organisations. And we're not as far along that journey as, as I would like. I think it, you see it running through the Sijini report. You see it in the Gillen report. Um, and there, there's a lot more work to, to be done in order to really ensure that that victim care and understanding is embedded at every level. I think it's right that um, you know senior leaders um, are setting the example there and are leading by example. And certainly, I would be really, um, I, I'm impressed with the level of engagement that we have had, um, particularly when we are looking at the recovery in the justice system piece um, in recent months. There, there's been significant challenges there, but the department and the minister has been keen to get get ourselves involved at early planning stages to identify issues and ensure that we know how to plan for them in advance rather than a reactive approach afterwards. That's really welcomed and I know the Minister had us come to the Criminal Justice Board to share the experiences of victims and witnesses to try and address those um, in December and that that's really that's big progress for me and speaks of that culture change but really what I want to see more of and what we're pushing and um, the agencies are, are working towards is how do we improve collaboration and communication at the local court level in particular, um, and particularly around things like case progression and planning, where if we get it wrong, members from their working constituencies know better than me, when we get it wrong, how much more damage we cause on top of the pain that's already being caused by the crime itself. So those are two for me, resources and that continued culture piece. Thank you, Jerry. And I suppose just on that, um, and just in terms of the steering group, then are the courts involved? I know the judiciary is independent, but in terms of you know involving um, the courts in this uh, discussion and in this uh, project going forward on action plan, is there any um, any indication of having um, them involved? 
So courts are represented on the steering group and, and have been you know, actively working with us as we're developing not just the, the action plan, but also the, the wider strategy that we're, we're working on. So it is, I think, recognizing that actually across all agencies, um, there needs to be that engagement across the, across criminal justice organizations. But also, as Jerry said, I think the thing that, that keeps coming out of every single kind of work stream that I'm involved in is that early engagement with, um, with witness support services is really critical. And uh, because everything actually you know that you do within the system is going to have an impact on on their capacity on their availability so they so they need to be at the table and they need to be part of that conversation early on yeah thank you and finally just um and it was touched upon earlier on i didn't bring it up with um jackie but with regard to wider education piece and um people not knowing about criminal justice system and and, and and what the the journey would be if you're coming into contact with it either as a victim or witness or even indeed as a perpetrator um but in terms of and i and i know we've mentioned about the department of health um and being uh, and there's some work and some communication going on with the department of health would there be any communication going on with the department of education on that I know it's a wider piece and I appreciate it's bigger than what we're looking at now, but it's maybe just a comment. But also in terms of um, getting information out on a victim's and witness charter, what that is, what people can expect, where support is. I mean, I my um, previous position as a counsellor was chair of PCSPs. PCSPs have a massive role in getting communications out there and linking up with different parts of the community. So it just it's just more of a comment. Could there be something looked at with regard to the PCSPs and the, you know going through information um, and just and making people aware of what this is um, and just uh, you know in terms of the charters. No, thank you. That's re that's really helpful. If if I come back to you on the the education piece first, um, there, there obviously has been engagement between the uh, with the Department of Education in relation to to Gillen and education there um, and. Uh, um, we haven't started actually looking at that in the context of the wider kind of criminal justice system and victims and witnesses piece. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks that, um, that uh, and actually it's, it's one of the recommendations around as uh, strategic communications to raise to raise awareness of the charters and I think that has to be one of our priorities um, and our first priority and kind of looking at, at strategic comms. I think on the charters uh, in, in more more widely than just stratcoms. Um, I think there are a number of different issues and um, I think public awareness is one of them if you don't know that they're there or if, if, if it hasn't, you know, maybe you've been told but it hasn't really sunk in that they're there and what they mean. I think um, that that's obviously something that, that, we, that we want to address that's concerning that, that whenever you look at the, the NIBOS uh, uh, responses that you know the, the low awareness of the charter so we are going to be developing a strategic communications plan to address those um, we are setting up a, a, a stratcoms group to look at that i don't think it's just a matter of stratcoms i think we also need to look at how accessible they are you know so and we have made them available in a range of, of languages we've made them available in a range of formats but i think we'll want to consider that further with um uh, with partners um, there's also, and I think this is the cultural piece, um, the question of, of how meaningful they are within organisations and, and the report, the Sajini report itself, um, noted frustrations uh, that, that officers felt that, you know, that, that actually, you know, the focus needs to be on uh, meaningful engagement and support for victims rather than a kind of tick box exercise. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked about the, you know, um, you know, the role of the leaders in that. I think it's a there's lots of layers to how, how you uh, address that. The training that uh, PSNI and Victim Support are going to be doing, that, that's part of it. I think it's um, what Jerry said earlier about it's not just when your woman from Victim Support turns up, but actually how do you make it meaningful on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a piece of work that, that, that isn't going to be completed overnight. It has to be an ongoing piece of work. I think there's also issues around uh, compliance and consistent delivery and, and again we'll want to look at that about what happens whenever entitlements aren't delivered and uh, the redress for victims and witnesses in that um, um, and, and I think uh, there's probably a role for um, the witness services, uh, support services in supporting victims where they want to make a complaint 
uh, and we'll also want to consider, uh, like I said earlier, the role of the Victims of Crime Commissioner uh, once one is appointed and how, what role they would have in overseeing um, effective delivery of charters. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in on that. No, okay. Rachel, is there any more points you just want to bring up? No, I'm all good. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, Linda Dillon just wanted to come back in very briefly and then we're going to move on, members. Sure, the point that I wanted to come back in has been covered, so thank you. I just want to, I got cut off earlier on. I don't know if you did that on purpose, Chair. <laughs> no. <but> <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm only joking. Just to, just to thank you all for, for coming in and, and answering our questions. It was certainly very informative, so thank you very much. It's covered. Thank you, Chair. Great. Well, listen, that'll, that, I'll echo the, the Deputy Chair's comments about thanking you for coming in. It's very much appreciated, and we'll follow up in due course, so thank you. Okay, members, um, moving on, um, obviously we've covered item six, um, and, and sorry, just to, to tidy that evidence well, sessions up, we will get a briefing, we'll ask for an update in terms of uh, their action plan and the delivery upon that for six months from now, um, and we'll seek to get that information on the back of this to keep a watching brief on what progress is being made. Um, item six was dealt with, item seven is the criminal justice a committal Reform Bill report, so it's pages 293 to 304 at our meeting on the 14th of January. The committee agreed to refer the Criminal Justice Bill to the Examiner of Statutory Rules and request a report highlighting any delegated powers to which she wished to draw attention. In particular, the committee requested views on whether it is appropriate for each of the powers to be left to subordinate legislation rather than including them in the bill itself and whether the choice of assembly procedure for each is the most appropriate. So the examiner has provided her report to the committee and has indicated that she is satisfied that the rulemaking powers presently provided for in the bill are appropriate and each is subject to the appropriate level of scrutiny by the Assembly. So members are, are asked to note the advice of the examiner of statutory rules on the delegated powers within this bill. Um, and in terms of then just to advise members that written submissions and oral evidence received by the committee on the committal reform bill have suggested that the abolition of committal hearings in other jurisdictions has not uh, demonstrated reduced delays in their criminal justice systems but instead has shifted delays to the higher court. Uh, conversely, evidence has also been received advising that a bill is to be introduced in the Republic of Ireland to provide for preliminary trial hearings similar to committal hearings which aim to reduce delays and increase efficiency in the, committal, in the criminal trial process in that jurisdiction. Reference has also been made to the statutory custody time limits and statutory case time limits in place in other jurisdictions and has been suggested that the introduction of these in Northern Ireland could assist in reducing delays in the criminal justice system. So on that area, uh, uh, in terms of those points that have been raised, um, if members... Uh, just to inform you that to assist consideration of the bill, two research papers have been commissioned covering the position in other jurisdictions in these areas and the impact or effectiveness of the different approaches being adopted. So members, if you're content, we will commission the research papers that are detailed in the clerk's memo in respect of that issue. Just going back then on the, the point raised earlier around the examiner for statutory rules, I think, Linda, you wanted just to come in on that. Sorry, Chair, no, it's not on that. I'm, I'm content with that. Just just to add to the two pieces of research, um, Chair, I know that when we met with the Lord Chief Justice, we had asked for a view around the Commit Reform Bill, and he obviously won't be coming before the committee until after the, the committee stage of this has ended. So... I just, we, we had had a conversation and I think that if the committee are agreeable we should write to the Lord Chief Justice and ask for for his view in relation to the committal reform bill yeah yeah no that that's 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 being action from last week's okay. meeting Linda so, last week I, I, yeah. I actually thought that but I, I wasn't 100% certain no. so apologies no no it's fine Covered. better better to, better to keep you. me on the toes <laughs> <laughs> thank you Okay, members, then the, the next item is the uh, item eight, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on injury on duty schemes for police and prisons. So it's pages 306 to 344. The department has provided an update on the progress that has been made in taking forward the recommendations that were contained in the audit office report in respect of these issues. Um, the, the 
a two-phase approach is being implemented, with phase one tackling urgent, some urgent legislative issues identified by the Audit Office, and phase two covering a thorough examination of the other issues in the report. The briefing paper sets out the key elements being considered, and according to the Department, a low COVID uh, and remote working has led to some initial delays. Work is generally uh, well underway in addressing the recommendations of the report. The Department intends to keep the Committee updated as work progresses and will brief the Committee on any changes proposed to the current scheme, and the Committee's approval will then be sought in respect of proceeding to a stakeholder consultation. So, if members are content um, in terms of noting this progress uh, to date, in terms of implementing the recommendations of the Audit Office report on the injury on duty scheme for police officers. Um, I was going to suggest to members, in terms of getting an update on this, I know the Policing Board do have an interest in this area, um, and I think it would be worth getting um, a response from the Policing Board in respect of their view of how the Department's taking it forward. I'm alert to an issue around how ill health retirement schemes are being handled, and there, I think there are some issues there that um, I would just like to get a take from the Policing Board in respect of, of that issue, which seems to connect with the Audit Office report, um, but in order to be more informed um, as to the official position of the Policing Board, if members are agreeable, we will share this information with the Police Board in terms of this update and get a view from the Policing Board if there's any other issues that they want to draw to our attention, and then we as a committee could pick up on that, um, if members are content with that. Um, Linda, Linda Dillon, if I can bring you in. Chair, you, you've actually picked up on the point that that I would have had a bit of concern around, and that's the fact that the ill health retirement is intrinsically linked to the injury on duty. You could effectively have a police officer have gone through two different processes, one with the PSNA, one with the um, police and board of the department, and it, it doesn't make sense. And I was just wondering maybe if we would, well, I mean, maybe the first step is to write to the the policing board actually I, I was going to suggest we write to the department and ask whether they're considering you know b both being taken on by the PSNA but if I think that maybe to write to the policing board is a good first step so I'm content that that's how we do it okay okay members well, thank you Chair. We'll, we'll proceed on that basis um Item 9 is then proposals to amend legislation governing retention of DNA fingerprints in Northern Ireland and the responses from the Department and to issues raised by the Human Rights Commission. So at our meeting on the 15th of October, the Department uh, provided oral evidence to the Committee on the outcome of the public consultation on proposals to amend the law governing retention of DNA and fingerprints. Following that meeting, Committee agreed that we would request views from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission on the Department's proposed way forward. The committee considered the Human Rights Commission response, which raised a number of issues and concerns at our meeting on the 17th of December, and we agreed to forward that to the Department for Response. The committee also agreed that we would forward it to the uh, Children and Young People's uh, Commissioner. For views, um, having considered the response from the Children's Commissioner at the meeting on the 14th of January, we also referred that to the Department for Response. The committee noted the response from the Department to concerns raised by the Human Rights Commission at our meeting last week. We agreed to consider it further when the Department uh, responded to issues highlighted by the Children's Commissioner, um, and, and, and that has also now been received. So the response is available. The matter is on the agenda then for today. Uh, the Department responded, indicating that it is disappointed with the Human Rights Commission, and um, does not think that the proposal, uh, in, in terms of their view, that uh, the Commission does not think the proposals go far enough to comply with human rights law. Uh, based on advice from the Department Solicitor's Office, the Department believes that including maximum retention periods based on the seriousness of the offence and a meaningful review process will ensure that the proposals comply with the findings of the uh, Gargran judgment, or Gochran, maybe it's better pronounced. Um, again, in response to the issues raised by the Commissioner for Children and Young People regarding uh, the retention of uh, the retention period for juvenile biometric data, the Department has advised that the age of the offender was considered within the equality screening exercises in the development of the proposals, and that the proposals continue to develop the less stringent regime for convicted juveniles first introduced in the Criminal Justice Act of 2013. It also states that scope for affording further mitigation for young people within the policy is limited 
particularly with the need to balance respect for victims and public protection. The Department has indicated that having made some significant revisions to its initial proposals in response to the public consultation, it believes that the revised package of measures present a balanced and proportionate response to the Court judgment. It is not minded to revise the proposals further, and the intention is to include the relevant provisions in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. So, members, that information is, is obviously there um, by way of the Department's responses. I'm, I'm open to, to receive some feedback. Um, Sinead Bradley, if I can bring you in. Thank you, Chair. And I think, um, although this is obviously the outset of the conversation, I think this piece of work carried out by the committee in terms of um, garnering those views has been critically important and are now on the public record and should firmly stay there. Um, but I, I'm just conscious that realistically, how much of this is going to really come in front of this committee um, in terms of having any scrutiny role over it? Because if the department are only looking now at drafting legislation um, with the view to putting it in the miscellaneous provisions bill, I'm becoming increasingly concerned how much within that bill is going to come in front of us. And I do um, think it should be noted that any future committee, um, if this doesn't cross the line, that, that this piece of evidence that has been gathered in shouldn't become lost. And I do wonder, Chair, as well, if we're running a tab on um, as a committee of what all is in this miscellaneous provisions bill, because it's, um, it's a piece of wonder to me. <laughs> And I would like to see um, to see it shape and form an ambition for its timeline. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the, the points are well made, and that's before members bring their own amendments to this bill whenever it gets introduced, um, given the the scope that will be permissible. Um, obviously, if it is in the miscellaneous provisions bill, you know, we as a committee will be able to to again delve into this in much more detail around the human rights aspects of it, um, and, and that would be um, available for us to do that as a committee. Um, we, we can, I suppose, I think it's timely that we, we could ask the Department for an update on this miscellaneous provisions bill to provide an outline of when it is going to be introduced and to, to detail all of the various areas um, that is going to you know, be covered within it. So um, I'm happy for the committee if we can agree to that. We'll we will ask for an update from the department on the miscellaneous provisions bill. Chair, they may want to put it through an accelerated passage. <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay. Well, listen. We will we will ask for an update on that. Obviously, if it is introduced and this area is within it, there is a piece of work that the committee will be able to refer to in terms of the consideration of um, this issue and, and how it's going to be taken forward. Um, the next item then is just correspondence. So there's four items of correspondence in the meeting pack. I'll just draw attention to one of those items, which was item three, um, correspondence from the Public Accounts Committee advising of the Audit Office report uh, that it has agreed to retain premacy over and include in its forward work programme to hold inquiries on and those that it has decided to release and refer to on to statutory committees to consider further if they wish to do so. So the PAC has released two. Uh, reports relevant to justice, one covering managing children who offend, and then a follow-up review, and the other covering mental health in the criminal justice system. At our meeting on the 10th of December, um, concerns were expressed over the findings of the report on managing children who offend, um, which concluded that successful reform of the youth justice system is at risk if fundamental issues are not addressed, and the committee agreed that if the PSE decided not to hold an inquiry into the report, um, that it may wish to follow up on the findings and the recommendations. So if members are agreeable, we'll request a response from the Department of Justice to the findings and recommendations in the report, following which then consideration can be given to whether any further action um, is needed by this committee. If members are content with that on that item. Um, again, in terms of um, reminding members at our meeting on the 22nd of October, the committee noted our response. Uh, from the PAC Committee on its reasons for not holding an inquiry into the report on mental health in the criminal justice system and the update provided to that committee by the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice on progress to address the recommendations in the uh, report. So, in, in terms of this, members, then we can um, seek to, to get a further progress report from the Department on this issue 
and we'll request that from them. Are members content that we action then the other items as outlined in the clerk's memo? Content. I'll take contentment. Um, just one item of chairman's business. Um, there's a an informal private meeting of chairs of all of the assembly committees um, with the House of Commons Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, and that's just to discuss Northern Ireland protocol related issues. So. Um, I'm hoping to get a, a justice-related brief on what are the, the remaining issues um, in respect of that. But that's a virtual meeting and that will be held next Tuesday, which I hope to take part in. Is there any other business members wish to raise at this stage of the meeting? Linda? Chair, sure. um, I just noted that the panel in relation to the victims' payments... Uh, um, the disablement payments of the troubles victims has been appointed and um, so I'm just wondering if we can ask the right to the minister and ask for an update in relation to that and also if we can get an update from her I know we did obviously see some stuff in the press but I would like a formal update from the minister in relation to the meeting with Branton Lewis on the financing of it Yes we can do that Just on that Chair uh Jim, I'll know this too, you have been on the Finance Committee, but questions were posed yesterday at the Finance Committee with regards to TEO's budget, uh, and they have inserted provisions of some 430, 430 million of provisions. Uh, when we asked, or sorry, it was Jim Oster and others asked the question around what that money was for, it came back that it was for the victim's pension. Uh, so. It's interesting that they put it in there as provision. Uh, now, it doesn't mean it's cash, but it's there as a provision. So it'll be interesting to see how that falls in the debates next week. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members, if there's no other business, then the next item uh, is the meeting next week, and that'll be on the 4th of March at 2 p.m. in the Senate chamber, and then via the Starleaf facility. So, members, thank you for your attendance today. We'll adjourn the meeting. Adjourned. Three.